Uh, kia ora tato, nai mai hare mai. Welcome back, uh, everybody. Right, uh, we move through, continuing through the deliberations. Uh, and our next one is a result of public consultation. It's from myself and the Deputy Mayor. Uh, it's around our tree maintenance um, and uh, the maintenance budget being increased by 100,000 year one and referred back to the annual plan process for consideration in future years. Um, the city has um, a fantastic tree canopy, I think arguably one of the um, best, uh, certainly one of the most in, in regional New Zealand. And it, it is at times our tree maintenance, and I know this is, I'm not hanging anybody here, um, They've inherited some um, some processes, and it's we've just got to keep up with the maintenance. Um, and if we don't, um, that's when things start to like any asset, um, and this is a natural asset, um, they start to get into some um, difficult diff difficult situations. So this is about giving um, our officers some more uh, resource, um, and uh, I'd like you to consider it, please. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. So we had um, many submissions around um, trees and the tree canopy planting, um, all sorts coming through our um, submissions. And you'll see through our list of um, other recommendations that there um, is a recommendation from Councillor Barrett and I to um, look at a, a policy. So I think that will actually look more to um, addressing uh, the, the issue as a whole, but in the meantime, we still need to do something um, in the short term until we can get that up. And so that's what this budget is um, looking at. It's, it's really a, a short term solution um, to have something in place until we can look at a, a bigger policy that will address the issues. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. A brief question, if I might, before comment. Um, just the, the statement there, the way that the recommendation ends, it says for consideration in future years, which is sort of open-ended. Um, just wondering if, if you, as mover and, and the seconder, might be willing to go year two and year three, because I think beyond that we're jumping into the next LTP, and that gives it better definition. I'm okay with that. And, um, okay, we'll just get that up. So I'll move on to comment then. Absolutely support this. Um, we've heard a lot of feedback from the community about concerns, and I certainly share those concerns. Um, shade trees are incredibly important um, assets for the city, um, for the community as a whole. They support property values and everything else, and we need to look after those assets properly. As the deputy mayor has alluded to, this is sort of, I see this as, as sort of two sides of a, a coin in terms of response. This is a budgetary response, but I think a policy response is going to be um, helpful for the community as well. Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, I, I support this uh, additional recommendation. And I think uh, one of the consequences of not having enough budget for tree maintenance is that uh, the areas of the city that have got overhead cables, uh, which uh, generally uh, is the western suburbs, those cities, are, those streets that have overhead cables and trees are in danger of having their trees removed because it's much more costly to maintain a tree where you've got to trim it back two or three times a year because of overhead cables. Um, in other streets, the trees don't need as much trimming. And if there isn't enough budget and it looks like certain trees uh, need to be pruned regularly, I think there's much more risk of certain parts of town losing their street trees. Um, and so, that would be quite inequ inequitable, I think, to an area that already um, it has to put up with a sort of lower level of service by having overhead cables. So um, I'm, I'm keen to see the tree maintenance budget be sufficient to maintain the trees we already have um, and not to result in trees being removed because they're too costly to maintain. Councillor Hapita. Um, I'm very keen to support this. I think across the whole city, I think um, we need um, a little bit more maintenance in this area. I think um, large parts of our community can see um, tree growth 
and maintenance of our trees is really, really well needed. So I think this um, increase in this budget, I think in year two or three, which is what Councillor Barrett has suggested, I think is a, is a good way forward. I just think it does just extends this budget for the team to be able to um, basically um, support these trees in this way. So I do um, fully support this, this recommendation. Uh, Councillor Butt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, obviously fully supporting this, but I have a question if I could ask. Isn't it on the services companies, especially regarding the overhead cables, isn't it, uh, aren't they legally bound to maintain um, the power lines by trimming the trees, or is this, it is 100% on the council? I'll get one of the officers to reply to that. I think there's probably two answers to that. Uh, no, the onus is on the tree owner to uh, maintain separation from the power lines. The closer the, the tree gets to the power lines, the more expensive um, the work becomes because it has to be done under emergency line control. So, Thank you. That was helpful. But I'm supporting it. All right. Um, that's... Uh, uh, Comments gone, or just in, just in reply to it, and I please ask you to support this. Um, we're just looking to help short term with extra resource, and I mean we're probably talking contractors here without um, uh, trying to be too operational. Um, but medium to long term, years two and three, I think it's great that we're looking at a policy um, that sort of has some uh, some understanding where um, uh, officers can uh, can go to. So you know, rather than a rather than a chop, it's a trim, um, and certainly um, perhaps re-establishing another arbitrist's um, team uh, to, to cope with the significant amount of trees we've got, and, and let's value them, because they're, they're valuable, uh, and uh, I think um, we, we've got, just got to fund it. We've got, no, we've got no option, really, other than chopping them down, and I'd hate to see that. All right, um, if you could vote, please. It has passed 14 votes for and one against. All right. Um, we'll move now to, uh, as a result of uh, public consultation, that the budget for Programme 1459 Social Housing be doubled to 14 million. Uh, and that the timing remain uh, in the same years, uh, three to five. Uh, moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by uh, Councillor Dingwell. Councillor Johnson, you can speak to this. Thanks, Mr Mayor. So, um, the reason that I've suggested that we increase the budget for new social housing is as a result of submissions and also as a result of our waiting list. So, if we look at submissions, first of all, uh, we had 33 submissions in support of social housing and seven submissions in support of us actually doing more. And some of those submissions were from organisations that represent large numbers of people. So, for example, uh, Community Services Council in their submission suggested that we needed to go further with social housing. Um, the waiting list is above 400 for our current units, and we've currently got 407 units, and we don't get much turnover because once people are in a unit, they, they tend to stay there um, because of all of the advantages of, of living in a, a council unit. So the budget that we had, or that we have currently in the long-term plan, is seven million, and um, it's spread over three years, uh, years three to five. And um, I asked staff how many units we might be able to get for that. Um, they pointed out that when we did the first stage of Papioya Place, uh, we got 50 units for 7.6 million. But also I would say that that was several years ago, and we're looking at years three to five here. So I'd be very surprised if we could get as many as 50 units for the 7 million that we've got currently in the plan. I think it'd be much more likely to be 25 to 30, realistically. So... Um, 
I think there's no point in us pretending that we're um, ever going to be able to build enough housing. We're not. Um, but I do think that our response to the housing need has got to be proportionate. And that's why I'm suggesting the increased budget. So the current budget is 7 million. The increase will be 7 million. It would take to a total of 14 million. And in uh, terms of cost, a um, million dollars capital costs about $1.50 per household per year. So we'd be looking at, this is from the consultation document, these figures, we'd be looking at about $10.50 per household per year uh, to put this in. Um, I think that the timing for this is, is very, very good. We're just going out for public consultation on Summer Hayes Street. We might have the opportunity there to do quite a big development. I want to make sure that we've got enough budget to be able to uh, do something significant around social housing. And if it's not Summer Hayes Street, well, then we've got other land that we can build on as well. So um, we have got a proven success in building social housing. Uh, we've got a very effective model and plans that we know are working well for our seniors. Um, so it's not as if um, there's a whole lot of uh, extra research and feasibility and so on that has to go into this. We, we've already got a very good partner that we're working with in Latitude Homes. And so I don't think that there's, there's a high level of risk with this at all. Um, we're seeing results. Uh, we're providing warm, dry housing to seniors. And we know that the demographics of the city, um, the seniors are, are only going to double in the next 20 years. So uh, by 2034, we're going to have double the number of seniors that we have now. And so I think that this is something really tangible that we can do for the seniors. Uh, as I said, it's a proven model that works and our response to the need has got to be proportionate. Um, and so I'm hoping that you will support it. Uh, Councillor Beatty. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, most of you will know that I'm really into promoting housing and, and additional social housing. And as Councillor Johnson said, we've already provided an additional 30 new units and refurbished Papua. However, I am not going to support an additional um, $7 million. I think that we've done our bit as, this, as Palmerston North is leading in New Zealand as far as housing goes, and it's time that the government coughed up. The government has not delivered, has delivered less than 50 social houses in Palmerston North in the last four years. They will not also consider giving us um, uh, loans or grants or anything for housing when we could deliver. So I certainly, at the cost of ratepayers who just cannot afford, and it's all very well to break things down to $10.50 a week, but you add every $150 million times $10.50 a week, it soon adds up to your three to 4000 and quite a big rent increase. I... I think that um, I, I totally agree with Councillor Johnson. I think we've got opportunities around Summer Hayes, perhaps Hughes Street and others, but let's bring the business case to the council. It may be that we can do a partnership. It may be that we provide the land. It may be we could do a, a three-way partnership, but I certainly do not want to add another $7 million in capital. Um, for housing, which I think is the government's responsibility and they need to start delivering and we should be doing more door knocking at the government's um, door. Councillor Naylor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I think this um, proposal is admirable but, uh, admirable, but I don't think it's realistic or affordable um, for council to take this on. Um, I think, you know, there's broader... Um, levers that we're pulling to address the housing issue as a council, and I'm, I'm proud of the work that we're already doing in this space, but I don't think we're in a position to be able to um, do more. I think the um, costs that have been outlined is, totally underestimate those costs. Colleagues, you, will, you were all a part of 
um, workshops that we set, um, and one of the general managers outlined to us that every six million of capital spend has an additional ongoing operational cost of a million, plus that's not even counting the renewals. So to simplify it, um, just simply to look at the capital costs is really short-sighted and doesn't um, appropriately consider the ongoing costs for that. Um, so. I, I just can't um, support it. We've got a plan at the moment that isn't even fundable as it is. I think it's really irresponsible to be adding um, significant additional funding to that. As you know, the LGFA says that um, you know it, they, we, they, we can't borrow the level of money to do the to do the. Um, capital works that are even in our plan already. And putting this, putting additional costs, particularly in the first three years, is totally unsustainable. Councillor Dingwell. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I agree with quite a lot of the comments that um, Councillor Johnson has made already. Um, in fact, her speech, her, her comments were, were almost identical to mine. Um, well, we're here talking about this because of the, the massive need in our community at the moment. We're here talking about this because of the 33 submissions that say that this is what the community wants. In those 33 submissions are actually submissions from organisations who are experts in the area of housing need. And they re represent quite a large proportion of our community. Um, when you're looking at... Um, and basically what they wanted was housing demand and affordability, um, including social housing. So when you're looking at the numbers, five years ago on our waiting list, we had about 20 clients who urgently needed homes and couldn't get it. Now we've got more than 400 in that five years. That's a massive, massive jump. And yes, it's not all down to council to solve the issue, but when you're looking at proportion, we are not doing enough. So I disagree with, um, with Councillor Beatty's comments around um, we've done our bit so we can rest now. I don't think we've done our bit. I do think we need to exp expand um, this program uh, to make a bit of a dent. It's, we cannot wait for the government to do this. And we haven't historically waited for the government to do this. So I'm not sure why, why we're, we're trying to do that now. It's everybody's responsibility to do their bit to make sure that people can actually thrive in our city. And when you're looking at social well-being, having a stable, affordable roof over your head, particularly for our most vulnerable members of our community, particularly for our seniors, and being able to provide the kind of housing that is one or two bedroom units that is desperately needed in this city, I mean, having um, this more realistic budget gives us more options to actually achieving that. So I, I urge you to support it. Councillor Denison. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Housing is important to me, and what we have um, is an issue not just around social housing, but housing in general. And I don't <laughs> think uh, it's right just to focus on social housing. Um, I agree that it's a central government responsibility to roll out houses. They've made promises, and um, I'm expectant that they will start delivering for our city. The... I think it's desirable for the council to put up more money into social housing, but to double the budget, I think, is, uh, is quite ambitious, and I don't think it's fair on the balance of ratepayers that have to foot the bill, when particularly many of them are actually paying taxes as well as rates, feeling like they're having to double contribute to the provision. What council, I think, needs to take a position to address the wider issues is to sort the consenting process out and some of the planning red tape, and I think we've been doing a bit of that work uh, to make um, housing in uh, the city uh, more uh, allowable or achievable. What I'd much rather see is government partnering with the likes of the Soho Group, which has had a fantastic outcome. There's a private investment for 46 rooms um, that have a government contract for 25 years to help support the um, housing needs of our city. Those outcomes when private investors can partner with government contracts can get great outcomes. With council outlaying the uh, foot in the bill for this, we, we've, we haven't got no guarantee of any government contribution 
and it's going to fall on ratepayers for the ongoing maintenance and repair, uh, renewal for those units, uh, particularly when we're only restricting the rental to 25% of somebody's income. So there's a huge uh, investment in social housing already, and I think it's one of those things, where do we start drawing the line? Some of the responsibilities that we can take on board is opening up land for development where we can, and we've done that with Tamakuku, and we're looking at Summer Hayes and Huia Street. There may be other blocks of land that council can review. We should make it streamlined for the planning processes for private investment to occur. I would encourage the government to look at um, uh, social housing providers in the region uh, to partner with them to see what could be achieved because it, to date it's been very limiting. And, and work through those avenues where it doesn't cost our ratepayer another $7 million. And when you're thinking of the proposition, $7 million, if we're going to achieve 25 to 30 units to, to benefit 30 ratepayers, I just, I've got a mixed balance and I believe a majority of our ratepayers would start to battle in their mind a council investment to benefit 25 to 30 households, units, when we're weighing up whether we should be doing it for safety improvements in roading, uh, recreational assets for the wider community, and likewise. And that's one of the battles in the 10-year plan is set, setting up priorities, and I'm struggling to approve a doubling of a budget for social housing, even in light of the need, because of those reasons I've outlined. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to um, Councillors Johnson and um, Dingwall for bringing us a bold um, proposal. It's, you know, there is a housing crisis on, so we actually do need to think um, big in terms of how we're going to respond to this, and it's been interesting listening to the debate so far, sort of ping-ponging around, um, trying to suggest that, um, you know, central government trying to suggest um, private investment. Reality is we all need to be in there to play, and what this would do is strength in our hand. It does not preclude partnership. It does not preclude other sources of investment. What it does is gives us some assurance that we're in a position to address what so far has been a, a skyrocketing demand for housing, especially social housing within the housing spectrum. And if we can get more movement here, we can actually free up a lot of other housing in the community that will serve some of those other needs. So there's a lot of flow on benefits from this as well, so I'm more than happy to support this. This is building assets, it's addressing need in the community. It's the sort of thing that we as a council should be doing. The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think, um, as has been said, this is a very bold and also being called ambitious uh, recommendation. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely supportive of the work that our council's done in the social housing space um, to date. I would absolutely support an increase of some sort in this space, um, but I'm, I'm still on the fence right now as to whether I can support doubling the budget. And I think for me, I think about the need of um, housing in our city, and it doesn't just sit in the ho uh, social housing space. There's a huge demand on rentals at the moment, and nobody seems to be building rentals. Um, we've got opportunities coming up with um, pockets of land in the city that have, have already been mentioned that may provide an opportunity to be building um, medium density rentals rather than them necessarily being social housing. So I'm, I'm a little bit um, unsure about a specific uh, increase to the social housing budget. I would be, I would be um, supporting a, uh, certainly a direction in terms of increasing budgets to be building housing. Um, but I'm, like I said, I'm not sure completely um, about it being specifically social housing. And, and I'm really unclear. Um, I appreciate the, the dollar figure that Councillor Johnson laid out, you know, $10 a year in terms of the investment um, to do this um, seems very palatable, I think, if people think about, you know, whether they throw some coins into a bucket that's, um, you know, for street appeals or make donations to different groups, then $10 to support social housing seems like a very reasonable um, figure that we could, we could talk to our community about. But I'm, I'm unsure what that looks like in terms of an actual percentage or, or rate increase, um, particularly alongside some of the other proposals that are coming through. 
Um, I think uh, Councillor Denison's talked about lots of other ways that the council can support housing, um, but I'm actually not convinced by this ongoing rhetoric that we need to address this issue of consents because through the um, CE's uh, updates that came out. Um, I've got the figures in front of me for the first quarter this year. We had 96% of consents processed on time. Um, we've been having positive feedback coming back from um, people who have received those consents around their experience with council. So there's this kind of ongoing thing around, oh, we need to fix consents and consents aren't good with this council and stuff, but actually that's not what the evidence says. So I don't think that's necessarily um, a factor in terms of that. Um, the, the idea that local government's done their bit also doesn't quite sit with me because I think local government provides local responses to our community. We know our communities best. We know the needs of our community and we can look at local solutions. So I, I do think we have a role and I do think we have a significant role. Um, the idea that we can pass this back to central government or, or call central government out on um, not following through on what they committed to um, is an issue, but it's not our issue, I think, to actually get involved in, because we could apply that thinking to just about any of the decisions that are gonna come up through um, our Connected Communities goal. If we look at things like increasing the strate strategic priority grants, that is to meet the needs of people in our community who are probably delivering social services that should be funded by central government. But we're not saying, no, we're going to stop that because that's central government's role. So I think actually we do have a role in housing. Um, I, would, I would be very comfortable to increase the budget somewhat, but um, I've, I've got to work out before it comes to the vote how I'll actually vote on doubling the budget today. Councillor Meehan. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> I'm a little bit on the fence with this one, the same as uh, the Deputy Mayor has just expressed. Um, we do have a housing crisis, but um, I don't know if I can support another seven million. I would like to point out, as it's been pointed out to me, that we have seven plus a five, so we actually have 12 million in there, not seven million at the moment for social housing. Um, and that was really just the point I wanted to make. I'm still on the fence with this, I'm not sure, so I'll decide at the end of the debate. Councillor Finlay. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Firstly, can I ask the officers, if we put in an extra $7 million, what would that put the rates up, please? One moment, caller. <coughs> Sorry, it's a bit more complex than no, is it? Little program. Give us two seconds. <coughs> hmm. um, so, um, a long answer to a simple question. Um, right now, uh, this work is um, balanced between years three and five, so obviously no rates impact for next year. Um, but once you start getting into year three and five, um, it's not only the capital you're paying for, there's also income coming in and operating expenditures coming out. So, so very roughly um, around $200,000 additional rates uh, just to keep them running and then renewals on top of that. So anywhere between, probably realistically, um, early on there wouldn't be a lot of renewals, but later on you're probably talking, I guess on something like that, a million dollars worth of renewals perhaps. Per year. So what percentage? That's one percent. So, so long term, you're probably looking at about one point three percent, one point four. Okay, thank you. <coughs> I'm very supportive of seeing more 
one and two bedroom houses being built in Barmerston North. Um, <clears throat> there's definitely a need, there's no question about that. But I reluctantly cannot support this for the mere fact that the people who would be paying for it in lots of cases are the people who would probably be worse off than the ones that are going into accommodation. Some superannuants now uh, have to count how many slices of bread they can have for morning tea or lunchtime or breakfast. And people might laugh that off, but it's not a joking matter. And by putting rates up to that extent is just not fair on those people. I would love to see more one and two bedroom houses done, but as Councillor Dennison talked about, let's do it in partnership. I cannot support this for the mere fact it's going to affect too many other people. So I won't vote for it. Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I had the same question that Councillor Finlay raised about the increase on rates. Um, probably reflecting on Councillor Meehan's comment that it's really 12 million. You should be careful saying those things, sitting down from Councillor Johnson, because she'll double it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think um, what I'm... I have a lot of sympathy for this, um, for reasons that um, have already been explained. And it's a difficult one, and I'm feeling a lot of support for it around the table, but maybe not at the price tag you've got on it, Councillor Johnson. Um, so, my feeling is that, <laughs> these are ridiculous numbers, but I feel like 10 million might be more um, in the scope of something that people might live with. And I wondered if you were minded to amend your recommendation. Through you, Mr Mayor. Not at this stage, Councillor Bowen, but if you're signalling that should 14 million fail, you'd be happy to put up 10 million, then I think that that might be helpful. Then I will so signal, Mr Mayor, that should 14 million fail, I will put up 10 million, and we'll see where we get to on that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, how the government should be doing this, other people should be doing this, somebody should be doing this. Absolutely, somebody should. We are somebody. Um, as Councillor Barrett said, this doesn't preclude partnership. Um, I would hope that it actually incentivises partnership. It's putting real skin in the game. I don't think it's enough for us to say we'd love to do something, but we can't, when actually we can, and we probably should. All right, um, it's exhausted the comments. Uh, right reply back to you, Councillor Johnson. No comment from you, Mr Mayor. Okay. Sorry? Did you not have a comment? No, no. Okay. Uh, thank you, and thank you, colleagues, for your comments, uh, which I've taken note of. And um, I especially liked Councillor Bowen's suggestion that I um, actually double it from 12 million, or that might have been Miss Councillor Meehan's suggestion. Uh, but just to explain the 12 million, we've got 5 million for the remainder of Papua Place. And in actual fact, it won't be 5 million. I think it'll be around about three and a half. So the budget that I'm talking about doubling is a separate line item uh, at the moment sitting at 7 million. So just to clear that up. Um, there's been a lot of talk about government and what government is or isn't doing, but I should just remind everybody that we did get four and a half million from government to do Papaya Place. So we have had government money into our own social housing building, and no doubt there's the opportunity for more money from other partners or from government itself. So I, I don't think that the argument that government isn't doing anything really carries much weight when we've happily put our hands out and accepted government money for our own social housing development. Um, so the idea is, a lot of adjectives have floated around about this idea, um, in particular that it is irresponsible and not affordable and short-sighted. But um, in response to all of that, I would say that these are an asset that we build for the community. Um, they're also one of the few assets that we build that actually have an income associated with them because people pay rent. If the need were to change and decrease, and they weren't needed anymore, they could no doubt be sold. 
So I don't see that it's a, an irresponsible build at all. I actually think it's a very responsible one and a response to need. Um, we've had some comments around uh, the general housing crisis. And I agree with them all. There is a general housing crisis. Yes, uh, we need more private houses built. Yes, we need more rentals built. But what we're talking about here is social housing, which we know from our own waiting list there is a massive need for. And we know that fewer people are going into retirement actually owning their own home. And Councillor Finlay raised costs for seniors. Seniors that retire without owning their own home really struggle to pay rent, especially in the current um, marketplace where rents are going up uh, very, very rapidly. And so this is something that we can do to address a particular housing need. It's not everything that could be done, but it is something that we could do. Um, in terms of the costs, um, the initial costs on rates will be nothing like the 1.4% long term. Actually, the initial costs will be around about 200,000 to run, which will be a very small amount to put on rates. And I think at the end of the day, we have to decide what we're here to do. That's why I've put this up. Why am I here on council? You know, why am I uh, subjecting myself to some of the uh, downsides of being on council, uh, of which there are many, I might add. And the reason is to try and do something significant for the community. And here's an opportunity. So if you want to do something significant for your community, here's your opportunity, councillors. I'll leave it up to you to decide how to vote. All right. Thank you, councillor. Right. We will vote. And that is passed. Ten votes for and five against. All right. We'll move to the, the next one, which is, uh, again, a result of public consultation. That program 1888, low carbon fund, be increased to 1 million per year from year one with inflation adjusted adjustments in year two and year three and, uh, excuse me, include annual reporting to council on funding outcomes. Um, this is uh, moved or proposed by Councillor Barrett, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Um, I'll ask you to speak to it, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a little bit um, on the hop here after turning the page. Um, Um, because it's, it got lost, the, the staff made it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, councillors. So this is um, somewhere further back in the deck um, of your printed at the top of page seven, um, but is, is brought forward due to the sum involved. Um, climate change, we've heard from quite a few um, submitters on this. They're concerned about um, the direction of travel that we have, which is that, that currently um, emissions aren't coming down um, fast enough. And, and I think those submitters are principally motivated by um, the sort of warnings that we're getting from science, the sort of warnings that we're getting from the business community that we actually can't afford the worst impacts of climate change and we do need to be working to urgently manage down our emissions. So as a council, uh, the new low carbon fund is really our main means of how we're going to work to manage down our own internal emissions. And um, pretty simple model, we su supply some resource and the experts officers actually prioritize how that resource gets allocated to get the best emissions reductions outcome. So it's a good model in terms of how we um, approach managing down our own emissions within council. Now in the workshops, you'll recall that the officers brought us a recommendation that we um, start this low carbon fund off at a million dollars a year. Um, and inflation adjust from there. So this 
recommendation simply restores that because um, in our perhaps haste in um, workshop, we um, chopped it from a million down to half a million during those workshops um, in year one and 750K in year two. So half a million bucks, climate crisis, what does that sound like? Well, you know, we know that half a million bucks will get you a shade house now in year four. Um, <laughs> It'll get, you, it'll get you about half of an intersection upgrade. So, you know, half a million dollars just isn't really much resource when you actually think about needing to retool this council to continue to deliver high quality services and high quality infrastructure in the future, but in a carbon managed and carbon constrained way. In fact, I'd say that a mere half a million dollars is rather paltry compared to what we would need as a credible response in terms of managing down our own emissions um, over time. So what I'm asking is, is that we do um, go with the officer's additional rec um, initial recommendation, which is, which is that we um, peg this at $1 million per annum um, from year one um, and get reporting back to council on those funding outcomes as well. So the second half of this recommendation ensures that um, given that this is a new fund with, with significant dollars in it, um, that we would get annual reporting back to council on those funding outcomes and what we're seeing in terms of managing down um, our emissions. So on that, I just urge you to um, consider this really first and foremost through a pragmatic lens. We need to be retooling as an organization to operate in a much lower emissions um, model, and this um, gets us heading um, in that direction. So I'd ask you to support it on that basis. Um, any questions or comments? I just have one, Councillor. So um, we've got another, um, uh, we have another motion on the same, um, on the same topic. Do, does this, what does this fund do? Does it have people or does it just do stuff? I'm not sure what it does. I think that's best directed to officers. So as we've discussed in previous meetings with our corporate, uh, further reductions to our corporate emissions, we've sort of tackled the low-hanging fruit. Um, so this, this fund was there to enable officers, um, you know, to effectively use the fund to help add to their projects to reduce emissions. So one of the things we found as we were looking for further reductions, those further reductions for projects typically were hard to anticipate and budget for um, when you're doing the long-term plan and the programs and forecasting out. Um, so this was seen as a sort of an agile approach in, um, in terms of providing a fund, as I said, that officers can then uh, go to as a, um, de delivering a project that might not necessarily have the funds or the budget to include um, a component of it that will further reduce emissions. So the idea is that there would be a, um, a group of officers who administer the fund um, on, on behalf of other officers who are tasked with delivering projects. So sorry, um, if I can just ask, um, and it was really directed at Council about. So does this include staff or not? So, so when I say a fund, it's really an internal fund for Council projects. So um, it, it, as a, it's, it's effectively a, a program or a budget. So for instance, if you were delivering a, um, a changing room upgrades and you couldn't quite uh, afford within the budget to include some solar energy, um, then as part of delivering that project, you'd go to the fund and use that to help that to get across the line. Okay, so you wouldn't plan to do the solar energy in the actual budget itself? Well, w what we're finding is that it's, very, it's at, a, at an early stage with the um, program planning is it's difficult to anticipate every opportunity to reduce carbon. So this was seen as a, um, an agile approach in the short term to build our ca capability to understand how we can further reduce emissions as, as we're delivering projects. Okay. All right. So... Um, Sorry, if I can just brief. So it is a capital budget. So. Okay. Thank you. That's um, Councillor Hancock. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Miller. Yes, I, I, I probably just need a little bit more clarity around sort of um, like um, David talked about the um, uh, the low hanging fruit. We've met, we've managed to actually bite that off and do some work around that. Can you give us some examples of, of and, I, and I don't really think the, the solar panelling is actually a good example. Like, I think if we're talking about really getting to 
the grist of, um, of, of managing our carbon emissions has probably got to be something a little bit more substantial than that. So what are the kind of things that we would be able to tackle if we have this fund? Well, the first part of your question, so we've done the LED um, street lights. Um, we've, you know, we've looked at a, a, range of, a range of initiatives in terms of reporting our corporate emissions. But what we were finding in terms of working with the officers for further reductions is that typically every time there were opportunities to further reduce emissions as part of our project, we simply didn't have the budget to deliver them. And it's, as I said, it's difficult to anticipate them. So the solar, the solar energy is part of a club room with a hypothetical example I've sort of raised on the spot. There will be, um, you know, a, a range of different ways that we can think about um, the way we deliver our projects. But at this stage, as I said, it's very difficult to anticipate those every time. And and officers were, um, in, in most cases, when presented with opportunities, struggling to deliver them within the budgets. All right. I still, yeah. Um Uh, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm happy to support this recommendation that uh, Councillor Barrett has put up. Um, I think when we look at our vision and goals, um, goal four is probably our weak spot. Um, it's got uh, equal ambition to our other goals, but it doesn't necessarily have the um, resource to um, enable those goals to be met at the same pace. So I think... Um, the increase to uh, this fund, restoring it to the original um, recommendation, um, provides the flexibility to be responsive and agile um, when opportunities present themselves. So um, I think the, the example the officer's given, in some cases it will be fine to plan for aspects such as solar um, when when we're looking at new builds or those sorts of things. But that's not always the case. And so having the flexibility for um, applying a um, lens of looking at achieving goal four over the decisions that we're making as an organisation means that this uh, this fund will enable uh, that flexibility. So um, I'm, I'm happy to support it. I think that um, it's all well and good to have have ambitious goals, ambitious targets around reducing our emissions, um, but we need to match that ambition with appropriate funds. And um, this is one step towards doing that. Um, councillors, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with it. Um, I appreciate what we're trying to do here. Um, the officer's replies made me even a little bit more confused around the looseness of everything. Um, to put solar panels on a changing room, and I know that's probably not a good example, um, is, but look, water tanks, solar panels, can't they be treated through a district plan review? I'm just wondering if there's more ways, we, we, we're taxing or rating the very people that we're trying to help. Um, I get the goal four, uh, and we have made some good, everyone seems to have forgotten the good progress we've already made, and I know that's the low-hanging fruit, and we need to do some, some, some better work here, um, but yeah, I'm struggling with the $1 million um, that's come out from nowhere. But anyway, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Councillor Naylor. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with this one as well. I certainly have um, heard the view of the community that's come through really loud and clear through this process and other processes that they want to see that we're being more proactive and doing more in this space. Um, however, I also... Um, of the understanding, and I'm hoping someone will, will correct me if I'm wrong, that this is a new fund that has been established to do that very thing. And, I mean, it's not an insignificant amount of money that is gradually being built up from 500, 769 to then 1.049 million in year three. And I think there is something that is reasonable and sensible about not just doing it you know, needing to create a process to be able to re evaluate the effectiveness of that investment as we go rather than just um, full on from year one. So I'm actually comfortable with um, how it's currently in there. Um, there's, there's actually no funding for, for the years four and out for, for that fund, and I'm not quite um, sure why that is either. Um, perhaps it's, yeah, 
so that's that's another question I have. But at this stage, I'd, I'd prefer to leave leave the funding, which is significant um, as it is in the plan. Uh, Councillor Dingwell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think it will come as no surprise to hear that I fully support this um, recommendation. Um, this recommendation has been put up because, again, submissions. People have told us that we need to do more on climate action. And we are doing some things in this space, um, but often we get told, what is council doing in our own buildings, in our own facilities, in our own um, way of operating? And as leaders, we need to set some decent examples and show how we, we can reduce our own emissions in our own space. Um, and so I fully support the initial recommendations from officers of um, the fund being one million. Um, and, it's, and, and it's mainly to give the officers space to be able to make the appropriate decisions around um, what's needed in, in this area. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I don't know what is the best way to, to achieve low carbon in our organisation, but I'm sure they'll tell us uh, when they come and do their reports. Um, and I think for us as well, um, when we're looking at this kind of funding, this is one of our goals. You know, being an eco-city is, is something that we've all set out to do, and we are trying to reduce our emissions and work towards actually, eventually, becoming carbon neutral. How do we start doing that without actually putting some money where our mouth is? Um, and so what could we do with this fund? A lot more with $1 million than we could with 500. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, I think, like a number of us around the table, I was a bit unclear as to exactly what this programme was going to be doing. And I think that that's probably what led us in the workshop to deciding to cut it when we were looking to try and make savings. Um, but the problem with uh, us uh, cutting things that we don't quite understand is that uh, it can have unintended consequences. And one of the consequences of not having enough money in this fund is that we won't be able to achieve our stated goals of reducing the climate emissions of council, uh, let alone uh, doing anything to affect the climate, the carbon emissions of the city as a whole, which we recently had a report on are actually increasing, not decreasing. So um, I do think that we need to go back to what officers recommended originally as a suitable sum to put into the plan to be able to meet our goals around climate change. And uh, there's another program coming forward about some staff resourcing, but uh, ultimately uh, it, this comes down to me to the fact that I think that we're really underdone in the climate change space. We're really underdone. And it's not going to be one additional staff member or one increase in a fund here. There's quite a lot more that needs to be done. This is a start. There's certainly not everything we need to do. But um, if, we don't, if we don't want to be just um, having hot air and actually we want to be delivering, then we've got to start putting the resources into the, into the budget that will do that. So I will be supporting it. Uh, I do understand some of the kind of, um, well, not quite confusion, but some of the uh, lack of clarity around it because it is a new fund and we haven't quite yet seen what it can do. Um, but at the same time, I think unless we start doing things differently, we're just going to get what we've always got. Councillor Butt. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Almost every one of us talks about big goals, big ambitions, big projects, and these things take money. And when it comes to action, some of us are sitting on the fence, some of us say, oh, I don't think it is workable. I, please bear with me, I'll give you an example or um, a joke. A gentleman for, went for an interview with the army and they were having a war after a few months. And the interviewer asked the gentleman, what are your requirements for being into the army and fighting the war with us? 
He said, oh, I want a very thin and airy kind of uniform in the summer that I shouldn't feel heated or warm. I said, all right, tick. What else do you need? He said, in winter, my uniform should be a big woolen jumper and long shoes and sho sho I shouldn't feel any cold. I said, all right, tick, accepted. What is your third demand? He said, I want a six months leave when the war begins. Right? So that's what we are doing. When it is time to action, we are, we are asking for a six months leave. So I'm, I'm not going on a leave. I'm, I'm fighting a war and I'm supporting this. Councillor Beatty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a new fund, and we've put, we've already agreed to put 500k and half a million. And I'd actually like to know what we're getting for that money. And to me, it's not clarified. You know, it's not clarified. So, if I'm going to be in a war, I actually like to know what it's going to spend. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I think we should give it a chance. I mean, we can always come back to annual budgets, but I can't tick off another 500k when all I've been given so far is that it could be used for solo panels. And also, I'm a little bit worried that it could be a slush fund to actually promote some other projects, capital projects, that if we, don't, if we haven't got clarity around it, and I'm not saying that it would be, but if we don't have clarity around it, you can't just sign off half a million dollars another half a million, but I'm happy to support the 500. All right, back to you, right of reply, Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks to you and, and to colleagues um, for your comments, and, and uh, it's been um, useful to just understand where some of the, the concerns are around it, and, and I think, um, you know, much like um, some of you, certainly what the Mayor said, um, what Councillor Batish just said, sort of that, um, what does the what does the funding model actually do in that? And certainly, my initial preference was that actually the council um, council staff would have brought us a, a list and said, "Well, this is the thing that we're going to invest in, and here's the next thing, and here's the next thing." Um, but if that were the approach, um, I think we'd run the risk of of then us trying to be the experts and make decisions around what should or shouldn't be in to um, uh, the investment envelope for managing down our emissions. So I think this is actually quite an appropriate approach where we create a resource and leave it with officers as, expert, as experts to um, deliver that um, over time and to report back to us with annual accountability, which is where we'll see um, how we're actually progressing here. So, you know, fundamentally what we have here is a decision about um, being serious about the targets that we've set, including the targets um, in goal four and making sure that we're um, backing those up and making sure that we're listening to the community when we hear submission after submission concerned about um, their future in terms of, of the climate disruption that's happening through um, business as usual and acknowledging that we need to retool as a council to be a much uh, lower emission and more carbon efficient organization. Um, it has come through a time and time again that we have been making good progress, which is great. We should absolutely celebrate that progress, but acknowledge that at the same time that officers have reported that progress, they've also reported that the low-hanging fruit have been, um, let's say, picked. And, and to continue to make the sort of progress that we need will require a uh, resource to move us in that direction. So a yes vote here is a vote to keep putting runs on the board and make sure that as we travel into the 2020s that we're making good progress around managing down our emissions and remaining a future fit organization. We, have, we know what the solution is around um, climate change. It is managing down our emissions. And we have a choice in front of us today. Do we want to actually get on with that job and be able to look um, others look um, the next generations in the eye and said, yeah, 2021, we had the opportunity to manage down our emissions, and we did it. If you want to be able to say that you did your level best, then a yes vote is the way to vote here. All right, councillors, we will vote on this. Thank you. That is passed nine votes for and six against. All right. We now come to um, 
The next one, which is around a result of um, uh, public consultation, that 100,000 operating budget for program 1920, climate change and sustainability resource be established from year one. Uh, and this is brought forward by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Councillor Johnson. Deputy Mayor, we'd like to speak to it. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just briefly, uh, we had a number of submissions asking um, the Council to uh, take action in terms of um, a response to climate change. This was a, um, a program that was first put up to, uh, by staff that didn't quite make it through uh, the draft, um, and it is for um, staff, it's a staff position. So. Um, it's great to have resource to be able to um, respond in terms of programs and those sorts of things, but we, we also need somebody to be able to do the work. So this is specifically for a, um, a staff position, um, and we had a, a large number of um, submissions requesting that, um, that more work be done in the climate action space. So this is, I think, a, a direct uh, response to that. All right. Um, are there any questions or comments? Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, just to remind elected members how, um, how this um, proposal came, came about was that when we were receiving the report um, about um, the citywide emissions, uh, we found out the citywide emissions had in fact increased by I think about 12% or something like that. And um, we also were told that the low carbon roadmap wasn't yet ready and it, and it wouldn't be ready for several months. And in questioning, it, it came out that really uh, there was insufficient staff resource assigned to this project. Uh, not even one full person's worth of work uh, going into it at the moment. And so, our expectations um, of what we can achieve um, are, are a lot bigger than the resourcing that we've put into this uh, area so far. And uh, staff had in fact recommended additional resource go into the long-term plan um, and that had uh, not been taken forward. So, you know, on reflection, um, it seemed to me that if we want to be achieving the goals that we've set for ourselves in the city, um, we need to be setting ourselves up for success by actually having sufficient staff resource to provide the expertise and the um, advice that we need. Um, you know, with the exception of Councillor Butt, none of us is an expert in this area, and it's actually a, a difficult area to know how to be effective and how to get behaviour change from people, which we know is difficult at the best of times. Um, you know, the climate change portfolio team met with uh, um, members of the public in the library recently, and the biggest message that we got from them was that they wanted to be, they wanted council to lead the way. They wanted council to lead an education program. They want council to be clear uh, with the public about what the public need to do. And if we're going to, if we're going to achieve all of this, um, we've got to have adequate staffing for the work to be done. And so I'd urge you to support this. I think it's more important even than the, than the fund that we voted on uh, just, just, just now. So um, if we want to achieve what we need to achieve, we've got to have the resource in place. Um, councillors, I will support this. Um, some may remember my um, somewhat ad hoc chief science officer role, because um, I felt that uh, council was doing lots of good work, and I see it come across at my desk in different units, And um, but it is not pulled together, and that's why I pushed hard for the Environmental Sustainability Committee, but also the annual report on our uh, environmental report, um, because we just weren't telling our story um, well enough, and we weren't connecting all the dots. Um, maybe I was ahead of my time. This is very much um, that sort of resource. And I do believe it's, in my opinion, arguably more important than the fund that we've just created, but that's, that's great. It means this person, people, um, can absolutely um, use that fund uh, to 
uh, encourage their colleagues within this organisation uh, to make improvements. So um, I think this is a reasonable response and a timely response to um, engaging in, in, in the climate change and the sustainability space. So um, I urge you to support it as well. Uh, Councillor Barrett. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and certainly um, won't come as a surprise to anyone around the table that I think this is a very good investment in us as an organization being able to more properly engage with um, the community around the climate change response, more properly engage with central government around climate change response, noting that we're um, working in a climate change commission um, process at the moment that is informing central government decision making, I would have every expectation that like central government does, they'll take some of that responsibility and they'll kick it into local government. We will need to be tooled up as a council um, to be responding appropriately in terms of our planning and in terms of our monitoring around climate change work, not just within the council, but for the wider communities. Um, benefit as well. Um, most of you were at the last environmental sustainability um, committee meeting, but for those that weren't, um, it was quite sobering to get that report that showed that um, our emissions community-wide um, were very much tracking up still, um, and that we hadn't yet started to correct that. And in fact, they're tracking up per capita as well as tracking up per GDP. So really, any way you slice the pie, we still hadn't managed to start um, addressing the wider um, emissions challenges that we face in the community, and this is a beginning, a, a positive beginning towards the resource and that we need to engage strongly with the community um, in that space, so certainly be supporting. Councillor Naylor. Thank you. I think um, this is a really important um, program and would be of, of value. Um, I guess my concern is that we're um, finding many um, high priority, high valuable things to add to the budget, but we're not looking at how we can accommodate that um, within our existing resources, and we're not substituting other things that are less important in order to do that. If it's truly important enough, um, I think we need to look at some reprioritisation um, processes to um, included in our plan, but without it having an impact on the rates that it will at an additional 0.1%. And as we get throughout the day, it's not going to take us long to be at 8% eight, at 8 um, and then perhaps even higher. So, look, I'm just not prepared to support additional e um, programs, even if they are important and even if they are valuable, without a process of substitution or finding a way to do that within our existing resources. Our existing resources have been significantly increased um, and I think we need to be looking more carefully at how we can do better with, with what we've already got in the plan. All right, um, I'll go back to the uh, mover. You're fine with no, no, no need to write a reply. All right, we have the recommendation there. Um, councillors will vote, please. And then it passed 12 votes for and uh, three votes against. Right, we'll now move to the last of these bigger ones um, that uh, as a result of public consultation that the council commits to the principle of the living wage for staff and contractors and that this is phased in over three years, starting by uh, paying a living wage to staff from 1 January 2022. Um, uh, um, moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Butt, um, and I'll go to you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, so, the commitment to paying staff a living wage is something that I have wanted the Council to do for a long time, uh, for many years, even before I was on Council. And why is it important? It's because um, a living wage enables our employees to live a decent life. Now, at the moment, there's uh, only $2.75 between minimum wage at $20 an hour and the living wages it will be in September of $22.75 an hour. Um, 
So it's not as though it will be um, a hugely costly exercise. Um, when I inquired as to how many staff we would have that might benefit from this, I was quite surprised to learn that once the living wage um, increases to $22.75 from the 1st of September this year, that we'll have 196 staff who could potentially benefit from this. That's roughly a third of the council's workforce. And uh, those are staff who last year during COVID were doing a lot of the essential services to keep the city running. Um, the essential maintenance, um, the recycling, uh, the depot work, uh, the gardening and so on. And those staff uh, deserve a living wage. And I guess what motivates me here really is just a feeling of fairness. Um, it's fairness to our workers to pay them enough to be able to have a reasonable life. And we have a duty, as we often say in all other respects, and we've talked about it already today, to be a role model. We've talked about being a role model for carbon emissions, we talk about role models for, for social housing, but here we're talking about being a role model for being a good employer. The welfare and the well-being of the staff of this organisation um, are very important to me, and I hope they are to you too. I know they're very important to the CE. Um, we need to be giving uh, political direction to what we think is a bare minimum, a bare minimum for people who are working for the whole of, of the city. And uh, this is something that nearly all the metros have done already. Dunedin City Council, Wellington... Auckland, Porirua, and many of them are already uh, living wage accredited. Um, what I'm suggesting here is that we make a start by paying a living wage to directly employed staff and that we phase it in to also include contractors. Because if you don't include contractors, then it's just a race to the bottom for contractors to pay the minimum in terms of wages that they can uh, so that they can get a contract. Um, if... Um, it hasn't been put on here, but I did put this under goal one because this is really a form of economic development. Um, what we know is that what we know is that uh, people who are on a low wage spend most of the money that they earn in the local economy, um, and so I can only see that this can be of benefit to the city, uh, having people on a on a healthier wage, and so. Um, we had lots of submissions in support of this, many of them by organisations, again, that represent a large number of people. Uh, CSC, for example, which is a 100-member organisation, uh, 100 organi member organisation um, so representing a lot more than 100 people. And um, I just ask for your support on this, councillors. I know some people see this as a, as a political issue. Uh, it's really not. It's a fairness issue for our essential workers who I think deserve more than just the bare minimum. Thanks. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm very, very pleased to support this recommendation today. Um, I think this is the third or fourth time, certainly since I've been on council, that this has come up, and I've been very proud to support it every time. Um, I just, I just want to quickly read a, a one sentence off the living wage website which explains what it is. A living wage is the income necessary to provide workers and their families with the basic necessities of life. A living wage isn't anything frivolous that um, allows for people to go on lavish holidays or anything like that. It's, it's talking about the calculation of being able to um, live with the basic necessities of life. And as Councillor Johnson's pointed out, we know that those people who are on lower wages spend their wages in the local community. It means that they buy an ice cream for their kids at the weekend. It means that they buy an extra treat at the supermarket or they stop for a coffee um, when they're out and about. They're spending their money in our local community, which supports our local businesses. The... Um, the living wage vote has come up at this council multiple times and I just want to remind councillors that we put it out in the last long-term plan with a very neutral um, sentence in our document. We had 51 submissions in support and two opposing it. 
51 submissions. Um, it didn't get specifically mentioned um, in the same uh, vein in this one, and we still had submissions in support. This is something that people in our community have been asking us for for years and years and years now. And so I think that actually it is time. Um, it was probably time a few years ago, but it is time now, um, and so I would really like to see um, us support that, um, knowing that it is going to directly benefit 190 odd people in our organisation immediately. As soon as it's phased in, that is going to make a real difference for people um, when they're getting their wages. So um, absolutely supportive of this, and I hope that everybody else is too. Councillor Dennison. A couple of questions, if I may, Mr Mayor. Can I understand that I understood when we've reviewed this um, item in the past that council actually pays above the minimum wage. Uh, is the increment above the minimum wage dollar or dollar fifty? Can I understand the update of how we pay? It's a dollar um, seventy, seventy-five. 70, I've got the nod at seventy. So we pay $1.70 above the minimum wage. Thank you. That's our standard. And can I understand that the staff comment in the summary of submissions are mentioning that it would cost an additional 230000 per year, that's just on our current staff. Is that over and above the increment we currently pay? Yes, it is. That's just for those people impacted. It's not for any flow-on effect. Have we got any idea, if we've got 196 staff ourselves, what that number might be for external contractors? I'd imagine it could be much higher than that. No, we don't have that information. OK. Um, some comments, Mr Mayor. Again, I think this is desirable, but I think in past reports, it has highlighted that we do pay above the minimum wage. An increment being confirmed today is $1.70 above the minimum. So we are seen as a good employer. In those past reports, it also said that the um, assessment against other metro cities like Auckland, Wellington and the like actually have much higher living costs than we do here. And that the minimum wage, uh, sorry, the uh, living wage is assessed with those other metros included and that a relevant regional living wage would be about $1.70, about where we're sitting currently, was reported through HR through an independent review. It also showed that it was questionable whether we'd get uh, any greater productivity. It also showed that, uh, that any vacancies weren't any more likely to be filled. And so, therefore, the rationale is only one of uh, an ethical one, I guess, if, if, as we it probably would come down for, not one of any greater benefit for the city as far as an investment. When we're talking with a figure of just staff alone, this is over and above our existing increment, is 230000 We're reviewing a 10-year plan, and you extrapolate that investment or that figure across 10 years, that's 2.3 million just on the payroll alone. That doesn't ad address any uh, sliding scale of those ones just above minimum wage as far as a continuum of recognition for those other staff that are just slightly above what's proposed as being a living wage. So therefore the effort of recognition of experience and, and responsibilities also needs to perhaps in my view be considered and so for some of those questionable outcomes and, and reason and the fact that we already have a figure here of 230 excluding contractors, I think having contractors included in this recommendation exposes us to a far greater number than that per annum. And without knowing that fact, I, I find it uh, questionable how you'd support that, knowing how tight the budgets are already, sitting at 7.2 and going upwards each year, and so I'm struggling to find the basis to support this recommendation here. And that um, probably covers most of my um, points well. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, Councillor Bart. Thank you, Mr Mayor. This morning I was uh, approached uh, 
by someone, a senior colleague, and asked me, do you run a business? I said, yes. And he said, I see you are supporting this or seconding this uh, proposal. Are you paying living wage to your employees? I said, no, because I employ two people. And I said, no, because I didn't think about living wage when we were doing our signing a contract. But later on, and we are two partners, Later on, when I saw these statements, we are already paying $2.90 above the living wage per hour to the, both of those staff. So if that was the only criteria, if my friend wants to be persuaded to vote in favor of that, I have got a screenshot of the last payment we have made. <laughs> I, can, I can show them that we are paying more than living wage. Sometimes, uh, Mr. Mayor, when I, when I think about something and I decide, and I try to find more, what do you call, intelligent and experienced people. For example, when I decided about that, I said, oh, I should, I should look for some more, um, considering myself as a Palmerston North, I said I should look, look, look towards some more experienced and, and uh, uh, senior colleagues like Councilor Denison. So I looked at Wellington City Council. Oh, they were paying the living wage. And then I saw, oh, I should look at Mr. Mayor. So then I saw the Christchurch, oh, Mr. Mayor is also paying the living wage. And then I said, they might question that even we are paying, Mr. Mayor is Christchurch and Mr. Dennison is Wellington or Auckland. What about a person like me or any junior council like me? And then I saw Porirua Council, they have started paying as well. So at least we should balance ourselves with the Porirua Council and, and, and decide to pay our employees and contractors the living wage. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think Councillor Dennison hit the nail on the head when he said this is an ethical decision. And I don't believe in trickle-down economics, but I'm prepared to give trickle-up economics a go in this setting. So I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dungwell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, hard to follow Councillor Bowen. That, was, that, that, I think, summed it up perfectly, to be honest. Um, when we ask, how can we afford the living wage? I think, how can we afford not to? Our people are the most important part of this organisation, actually. And we need to be investing in our people and um, making sure that they have the basic amount to be able to survive in our city. And when you think about things like the costs of living, we all know that our cost of living is increasing. The housing crisis has had an impact in Palmerston North. You cannot buy a house in Palmy now for under half a million dollars. You know, it, it, when you look at all of the different services, in fact, if you even talk to people who work in community services, they will tell you that they are starting to see a lot more working people come through their doors. There are a lot more working people who are on low incomes. And we as a council need to set an example and show people that we are willing to invest in our people and hope that the rest of our community will start to invest in their people. And so, um, you know, to increase our, our um, economic development in this city, to have more um, ability for people to actually participate in our community. There's only so many toasters rich people can buy, you know? So maybe we should be trying to empower everyone to, to, to be able to participate in this. And so, um, yes, I do urge you to, to support this. It is an ethical decision. It's a right, it, it is the right decision, and it's really saying that we care about our people. Thank you, Councillor. Um, look, can I just ask the mover? This is are we just we're talking about those under the living wage, aren't we? We're not talking about it. Your your motion's not about permutating it right through the organisation. No. no, it's not. And I felt that um, you know it was it, it's a political decision to decide whether or not to pay the living wage. After that, the basis of differentials, I think, is for the CE to determine one way or another. And if we're actually we're actually only talking about a very small increase in terms of an hourly rate. Um, 
I just didn't think it was reasonable for me to go further and say what all the other differentials should be as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because if it's not for all the other staff, then I'm... This is something I wouldn't normally support in the past. I haven't. Um, and I'm all for people being paid fairly, like Councillor Butt. Um, I've done that in business myself and in, in organisations, business organisations I've been part of. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've been good employers and paid uh, above. Um, and I've always seen the living wage, and Councillor Johnson knows this, uh, as a brand. Um, and, but actually, sometimes a brand needs to have its moment. Um, and, and after COVID, I knew who did the work in this organisation, and I know who didn't do the work in this organisation. And I appreciate that what some of our frontline workers did uh, for us as a city, uh, for us as an organisation, and uh, some of them are seriously uh, low paid um, in, that, in that space for the sort of work that they're doing. So I would support this for our lowest paid only, but I would not support it permutating through the organisation. And that's a political comment I can make, and I'm going to make it from the Mayor's Chair. Um, and so um, I would support this, um, but for those lowest paid people. Thank you. Can I um, just um, provide a point of clarification around that? Um, sorry, what? what in that it is difficult just to address this and not the other, the, particularly the next layer up, because you've then got people so close, you've got issues. But we're not, with all due respect to the CA, we're not discussing that here and now. We're discussing the lowest paid. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, like some others around the table, I voted in support of the living wage um, last time we had the opportunity to, and certainly will be again. Um, but just did, when I saw this come forward, want to reflect a little bit on the things that have changed uh, for me that I suppose have strengthened resolve in this space. And one is um, seeing the essential workers actually soldier on and get us through um, COVID. Um, and many of those were those workers that were on the lowest um, wages. We know that there's some of our longer term and, and quite loyal employees in many ways, and we continue to, um, you know, make budget allowances. Uh, I think quite um, uh, quite well considered budget allowances to recruit in other parts of the wage spectrum, um, and we shouldn't be then leaving um, those on the lower wages to um, languish when we know that we're in a time where the living costs are rapidly escalating. And I think, you know, some of the discussions that we'd had in, in prior terms, uh, I think actually probably did carry some weight at that time around some of the differentials between um, a, a perhaps um, regional center versus, a, versus one of the um, larger cities in New Zealand. But really, um, the headlines over the last couple of years will have disavowed anyone of the notion um, that we continue um, to have a, a huge differential in terms of cost of living, especially for those um, that are in um, the lower income category. So um, we'll be um, proud to vote in support of this today um, and moving forward as an organization that does commit to um, a living wage for staff and contractors. Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Um, I think the staff and our organization are absolutely um, our most important asset, and I agree that um, they should be paid accordingly. Um, and so I'm actually quite supportive of us. I think the living wage is a mechanism to ensure that that can happen. Um, I guess I would, l the issue is how, how that is funded. Um, so I would like to move an, uh, an amendment to, um, which would be seconded by Councillor Harpeter for um, to support this with the inclusion at the end to be funded within existing budgets. So my reason for um, proposing that is that we have had a significant, I think I mentioned it um, earlier, we have had a significant increase in the overall staff funding pool, uh, the, the, the salary and wage budget of around 7%. Um, we also have a number of programs that are in our plan that do give some flexibility. Just um, for an example, the workforce transformation of 250,000 is in there. 
what better way to transform the workforce but uh, than to pay them appropriately? And I'm not suggesting that it has to be done in that way, I'm just giving that as an example of how that could be accommodated. So I'm absolutely, um, particularly with the cost being fairly minimal in the overall scheme of things, 230,000 is what I think someone mentioned, um, and what, what we understand from our very many hours of um, workshops is that a significant amount of our budget is bundled in what's called MSL or maintaining service levels. That is a huge, a huge budget that we don't debate the individual um, aspects of that round the table, but does exist and probably makes up between 80 and 90% of our overall budget. We sit here and we debate the 10 or 15 or 20% that is the new programs or the programs that are carried forward. So I have every confidence that, um, I do think this is, um, th this is a good, th good um, way to move forward, and I have every confidence that we can do that um, within the funding, that within the budgets that we've got set in this plan. All right, councillors, we're going to have to we'll vote on the, um, uh, we'll, I should say we will further debate the amendment that's just come forward um, uh, first, and then we'll go to the um, substantive after that. So anyone want to comment on, yes, it's coming in now. Councillor Barrett. Yeah, so this is dangerous. Um, all sorts of unintended consequences coming out of this, like, you know, well, we could just hold on to a few more vacancies, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't think that we want to go into this sort of territory. The, the, the comment's actually quite right. It is a relatively minor sum, and we just need to actually get on with it. We should not be creating all sorts of risks around unintended consequences here, and I think actually trying to do the chief executive's job for her. I think we need to leave the motion as it was and vote on that, so I'll be um, stridently against this amendment. Councillor Johnson. Um, yeah, I don't support um, putting more pressure on staff salaries, and that's what this would do. So if you don't provide for the um, extra amount that's required to fund this in addition, then all that will happen is that either we'll have fewer staff or those staff won't get a pay rise when they also deserve one. So I, I just, I can't, I can't, <laughs> I just can't see the logic of this. It, it kind of is contradictory to the aim of the original motion, which is to improve staff wages. Um, if it's got to be funded from existing budgets, we know what's going to happen there. And I mean, you know, I was hoping I wasn't going to have to do this, but let me remind you, councillors, of last year's annual budget round, when... Uh, significant cuts were made from 4.4% to 1.9%, and the consequence was that this organisation carried 90 vacancies up until Christmas. And quite honestly, I would meet staff in the street and they would burst into tears because of the pressure they were under. And so uh, there's no way I'm supporting this from existing budgets. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I was going to tell a little story about 2022's annual budget, but um, I don't need to do that now. Um, I, this just seems like it completely contradicts the intent of providing a living wage in terms of um, supporting staff who are at the bottom, improving wages, supporting well-being, um, to go and throw um, stress and pressure, uh, not just on the people at the bottom who often bear the brunt of it, but on an organisation that has just come, was probably still in it, um, a really tough year where there have been significant staff pressures because of decisions that we made last year. Um, we are coming to the end of that uh, financial year, but those ramifications are going to last much longer than just uh, hitting a new financial year. Um, we still have vacancies that have been carried over from last year because of those pressures. So I I'm not interested in doing anything that doesn't alleviate that, and if anything would increase that, and I think that actually that's what this amendment is going to do. Um, it is, uh, as the argument's been, uh, not that much money, so let's just do it. Councillor Hancock. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr Chair. I just wonder if um, I could per perhaps just seek um, officers' comment just around the, uh, the implications of uh, being, being funded within existing budgets. 
uh, particularly in light of the, um, uh, the I, I suppose, the implications around compression uh, that will occur out of that. Um, yeah, I'd just like some sort of uh, general comments around that. Thank you. Uh, later on this year, we will be bringing to you a um, review that we are undertaking at the moment of our wages and salaries throughout the whole of our organisation. We already know that we are underpaying in a number of areas when faced with increasing competition from external providers, including government organisations and contractors. Uh, that is on top of any other considerations as well. This will, that will put in itself a significant strain on the budgets we already have in place. To then um, fund something like this and from within the existing budgets and there will be compression at certain areas, that will mean we will have to be flexible with those layers because we do want to retain good people and continue to attract good people at all levels of the organisation. It would make it extremely difficult. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. If I could uh, just comment. I'll, I, I, um, I would actually uh, support the, the, the original um, recommendation, not the, uh, not, not the um, amendment. Uh, I, I just think it's um, time for uh, us to uh, show some leadership in terms of uh, living wage. Um, and I take into account the, uh, the issues around uh, compression. Um, by lifting it to the, uh, the living wage, that actually gets us off on a uh, good platform so that we can actually move forward and make sure that we actually retain our staff. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'll go back to the right of reply to Council. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with um, some of the statements that have uh, been made. Um, however, I believe that um, progressing with this does actually allow the CE to do her job, um, but to do that within a fixed funding en envelope, and that's what we do anyway. What this would be saying is that that fixed funding envelope would be 230000 It would be the same as what we currently have in our budget, which would also be $230,000 less than it would be without this amendment. So what this, yes, it's a small percentage of the overall salary budget, but adding a $230,000 budget to our rates increase will add an, another quarter of a percent to the rates rise. I guess what I'm trying to do is this in principle, is get this in place that will give the direction to improve the income of the lowest paid in our organisation. And I think that's the priority that um, of the principle of the living wage. So um, I still think this is a reasonable approach and, and a reasonable way forward and certainly I think the size of the the bucket is big enough to ensure that staff are being able to be recruited and employed in an appropriate way. It's quite a small difference in, in the overall budget. So I'd urge you to support this. All right. Um, thank you, councillors. Um, just wanted to, there's been a, a couple of numbers mentioned and um, just had them corrected by the CFO. It's actually 290,000 we're talking about, not 230, which was, was mentioned earlier. Um, just that Johnson. the uh, recommendation, original recommendation to say from January the 1st, so it would be 145 for the first year. Right. 290 after now. Thank, thank you. Okay, so we're just going to vote on um, the amendment in red only first. And uh, that has failed with one vote for and uh, 14 against. Right, we now go to the, the original. Now there's no other speakers to this. I'll go back to um, Councillor Johnson around the right of reply. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor, and um, thanks, colleagues, for the extra points you've added to the debate. Um, I think 
really. Um, there's no there's no way we can pretend to be a metro council when it suits us and then not a metro when it doesn't. So, you know, if we're a metro council for the things that we want to be one for, well, then we're also one when it comes to paying our staff a living wage. Um, and in terms of, you know, the fact that we already pay more than the minimum, what that means is there's only a small cost, 145,000 the first year, 290 thereafter, to bring everybody up to the living wage. And it's an opportunity for us to show some leadership. So I would appreciate your support. Thank you. All right, councillors, um, recommendations in front of us there. If you could vote, please. And that has passed 12 votes for and uh, three against. All right, to that round of applause, I think we will now break. That's a good time to have a break. So um, we will be back in the chamber at 3.15, councillors.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, look, uh, we now will move through uh, to through the um, items in order of goals, uh, one through to four. Um, if we can speak to our uh, motions and uh, if we can try and move through with some pace, that would be appreciated. But I do understand everybody wants to have their say. So look, we'll move through with number one and goal one, which is in uh, reference to programme uh, 1803, uh, Neighbourhood Streetscape Improvements, delivery of the Highbury Avenue safety improvements to commence in year one of the 10-year plan. Councillor Johnson, up to you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> so um, if you're looking at the supporting material, it's on page 144 of the supporting material under Active and Public Transport Capital New. So the, the programme 1803 um, has got $30,000 in year one and $309,000 in year two. And my understanding from questions to officers is that the 30,000 is for planning and then the 309,000 is for delivery. Um, the situation at the moment in Highbury Avenue is that it's extremely unsafe. So you'll remember that last year we had a deputation from um, Tuakahuya uh, Social Services about speed along Highbury Avenue. I've had, uh, to Community Development Committee, I've had numerous approaches from community members. Um, not so long ago, a, a child was hit by a car on Highbury Avenue. And the issues on Highbury Avenue are um, the speed, the fact that it's a curving road, and then we've got the kind of humpback bridge just before the shops. So there are lots of issues in terms of uh, safety that need to be addressed. And um, Councillor Dennison has pointed out to me that the recommendation isn't clear about budgets. So effectively what I'm asking for is for the year two budget to be brought forward into year one so that the work can be done in year one rather than waiting for year two. Um, and I, I'm happy um, to take questions or, or questions to staff about it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I think it's relatively straightforward and you've explained it well. We're just moving year two into year one for all the reasons that the uh, Councillor has spoken to. Um, are there any other questions or, or comments? Councillor Finlay. Yeah, just a quick question. Will the staff be able to do the work or was it just going to be extra work that won't get done? We'll go to the um, Chief Infrastructure Officer. There should be a microphone somewhere there. Through the chair. Um, we have had a bit of a conversation about Highbury um, already as staff because this has been raised um, particularly because of the accident. Um, we, we could definitely move some of the work. We might not be able to move all of it, just depending on the results of consultation engagement, how long that takes us. We could definitely move some of it. Okay, thank you. Is that okay, Councillor? Good. Uh, Councillor Hancock. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Look, I just really want to uh, perhaps uh, support this for, uh, on behalf of um, uh, the mover. Um, the Safety Advisory Board has received um, deputations and comment uh, from uh, members of the uh, Highbury community. Um, and and the, the obvious things about the, that particular location is it's a narrow road, um, it's, a high, it's got a very high uh, vehicle count, and of course that's exacerbated by the, uh, the shopping centre itself. So. Uh, anything that uh, this council can do to support uh, improvements uh, on that particular road would be uh, very welcomed by certainly the residents. Great. All right, then no other comments, no need for a right of reply, councillor? No. Okay, we will vote, please. It's passed 14 votes for, one against. Right, we move to the next one, which is around street lights. This is an extra one that's come to us. Um, and this is from the Deputy Mayor, that, uh, uh, that a request for a street light um, at the Old West uh, Road, Turatia Road Junction, be included in year two of the low-cost, 
low risk safety program um, to the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Butt, to you Deputy Mayor. So this one's pretty simple. Um, I had, you might have seen a, a question forward around asking um, the cost specifically, and it was uh, responded to by council, uh, council staff that it could go into um, year two or three of the program that already exists. Um, so I just want to capture, because we did have a, um, a specific submission asking for this request, so I just want to ensure that that's captured um, and referred to it. So um, it's pretty straightforward, I think. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Uh, Councillor Barn. Speaking in support, I'm quite familiar with that junction, um, and members will be aware there's an awful lot of development going in on that side of town at the moment, which officers referenced in their comments. It seems like a sensible, low-cost safety um, intervention that we can make in that space. So I'd be grateful for your support. Thank you. Councillor Harpeter. Sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor, can we have in the uh, recommendation that it goes with an existing budget? My understanding it is. It is within. Can I just check with the officers? It is. Is there a nod? Doesn't it actually say that in the recommendation? It's included okay. in year two. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. We will vote, please. And that has passed 15 votes, four with one abstention. All right, we move through to an extra, another extra one now, which is um, uh, Johnson Drive. And this is from Councillor Bowen, uh, that uh, a temporary solution for Johnson Drive connectivity issues be delivered in year one from existing budgets. Councillor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. This is the issue that I raised in questions earlier, um, and officers... Um, in discussion, have identified that a footpath might not be the answer um, to the issues raised there. There's a great deal of agreement about the issues um, and potentially movement with NZTA in how we address those issues. So um, bringing forward this recommendation is intended to scope that quite broadly so that officers can respond to the issues in the way that they, in their professional opinion, consider to be most appropriate, as long as it's done quickly and in within existing budgets. And I'd be grateful for your support for this issue, which has been going on for about five years now, and I don't want to see our community waiting another four years for the bells and whistles when we can do something quickly now. Thank you, Councillor. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Anybody else wishing to comment? Or any questions of it? Okay, there is none. Uh, no right of reply needed. We will vote. Thank you. It has passed 15 votes for and none against. Now we move through to the next one in goal one, that... Uh, the tram, Manawatu Tram Trust uh, City Centre EV trackless tram project be included in the 2021-2031 long-term plan. That's from Councillor Hancock. Councillor. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, and we uh, seem to be on a roll at the moment, so uh, I, I won't take up too much time. Um, look, the, uh, the, the submission for the uh, Manawatu tra uh, Tram Trust proposal um, that does not require any budget at all. Um, the Tram Trust um, have uh, basically said that they will fundraise the, uh, the money for uh, the Heritage uh, Electric Vehicle Trackless Tram, uh, and that would be to move uh, people about um, our CBD, uh, either through uh, free of charge or gold coin donation. <coughs> now, Council could, uh, so we could simply just um, endorse this as a good idea, but of course that does not actually commit Council to anything at all. Uh, the project is supported by both the Chamber of Commerce, um, submission number 393, and Environment Network Manor 2, who provided a letter of support uh, which was appended to the Tram Trust submission. Environment Network Manor 2 stated uh, that it strongly supports innovative carbon neutral uh, public transport initiatives. Um, through the LTP process, the following numbers of submissions were made. Um, numbers of submissions were made to certain subject groups, and uh, just, just so that you're, you're aware, uh, 31 submissions received uh, uh, directly related to uh, reducing carbon emissions. 47 submissions, that's 47 submissions, uh, sought higher use or better accessibility to uh, public transport. 
14 submissions uh, seeking better active or public, uh, or public transport. A further submission, number 609, referred to a mini shuttle service uh, for the CBD and uh, also raised the idea of park and ride, uh, which of course the Tram Trust has also uh, talked about. As stated, the uh, Manawatu 2 Tram Trust is not seeking funding, but have sought uh, City Council support to have the proposal included to the long-term long plan as either a line item or placeholder. Um, the intention is to ensure that Council places a premium on alignment of uh, streets development, pedestrianisation of the CBD, alignment of public transport services, and accessibility of uh, all people to our CBD to support business, and uh, priority on sustainable transport solutions also to be considered in that, um, in that bunch of things, of course, is the, uh, the uh, bus terminal, uh, bus terminal uh, development within the CBD. It's very important to create alignment across these things um, in terms of the viability, vitality and vibrancy of our city centre. Um, there are approximately 40% of our population that are uh, in the seniors group and uh, Palmerston North also has a higher than average disability population. While pedestrianisation uh, of our central city has benefits, uh, it can also reduce accessibility for many in our community. Um, as a city, we are fortunate to have uh, Thimarai or Hine, the square at the heart of our city centre, but it does create dislocation and significant distances between business, retail and our cultural precincts. Catching a bus to, uh, to Main Street and then walking across town won't, won't work for many people. If we don't commit to this, I would wager that uh, in 10 years' time we will still be complaining about the inadequacy of our public transport systems and issues pertaining to pedestrianisation of our city centre. The Manawatu Tram Trust project should be taken as a catalyst to create momentum uh, to this change. So what I'm seeking is for this to be included to the long-term plan so that we can be solutions focused and support, and I urge you to support this recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've just got a couple of questions. Um, as the resolution stands, I'm unclear what this means, because with a placeholder, there would be a budget attached to it, or with a line item, there would be a budget attached to it, and, and the mover's not seeking any funding to be committed. So I'm trying to understand where in the long-term plan this would go. Back to you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Look, um, I, I've also probably sort of... Um, yeah, I've, I've had concerns over this as well because it kind of sort of lands awkwardly uh, in a place which we may not, may not necessarily traditionally uh, place something like this into the LTP. Uh, I'm happy to take officers' advice as to how we can actually uh, progress this to make sure that we do get the alignment across our planning processes and we start to think about getting all of, I suppose, a workable, meaningful public transport system that supports our community. I think if the resolution passes, or the recommendation, um, the, this, I guess the only way I can think of, of giving effect to it would be to put a sentence or two in the transport plan that talks about the fact that council uh, supports in principle the idea of the, the tram trust and looks at ways to collaborate with the you know regional council or um, the tram trust to help deliver it. So beyond that, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that's what you're seeking, isn't it? You're seeking some sort of endorsement that can influence um, our um, public transport um, plan, which of course we don't really own, uh, but we can influence because the vast majority of it falls in the city. Uh, the answer to that, I guess, is yes. Uh, but having said that, my reservations really are around uh, making sure that we actually have some meaningful um, conversations and work with the relevant partners to ensure that we actually do something about it. Like, it's all very well endorsing it, but that does not really commit council to any specific activities uh, or draw in some of the uh, potential partners. So just a follow-up question, Mr Mayor. If this is a item to do with public transport, then I'm trying to understand why we would be moving away from endorsing the idea or, or providing support for the idea to actually then including it 
within a plan when we don't run public transport that's not within our well we've got another one <coughs> excuse me we've got another one which absolutely does try and influence that so I mean there's nothing wrong with supporting this if we want to support it of course we don't need to support it and we can just kick it for kick the can down the road um, it, that's what you're seeking isn't it support endorsement absolutely yes mm. we either choose to do it or not do it So, I'd like to move an amendment yep. um, that the Council notes support for the Manawatu Tram Trust City Centre EV Trackless Tram Project and include our support through the, through the long-term plan. And that would, my view is that would um, then convey the support for the project without putting it as a line item. It can be worked through our transport policy, it can be worked through our activation in terms of city centre, those sorts of things. It can, it can be worked through that, but it's not a line item with zero, 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 zero for the next 10 years, um, which I, don't, I think is what the, the mover was trying to capture, but um, yeah. If there's a seconder for the amendment. Yep, okay. seconded by Councillor Johnson, thank you. All right. Okay. Um, Councillor Harper. Thank you, and thank you to the Deputy Mayor for um, helping Councillor Hancock. Um, I fully support this because I think we all want to see less cars in the CBD, and that's what Councillor Hancock is trying to do, was trying to put this forward and trying to support the Tram Trust by doing this. So that's basically where Councillor Hancock was coming from. So thank you to the Deputy Mayor for putting those suggestions forward. I think um, at the end of the day, we are trying to enable Horizons to do something, and we can't make them do it without this, putting something like this forward. So that's where Councillor Hancock was coming from. So um, well done on putting this forward, and well done to the Deputy Mayor for putting those words up. So I fully support it. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Um, I, I, I'm speaking to the amendment and the whole thing. Is that okay? Yeah, so I support the amendment because I think it makes it clearer what we actually want from this. Um, and I support the project because it's kind of quirky and I think we need something a little bit sort of quirky and interesting in the, in the CBD. Um, and I think it does tie in with our carbon uh, emissions scheme, trying to get people to use private vehicles less. And um, it ties in with the... Um, creative and exciting. So I think it, it's a nice fit. Um, I'm not sure whether it's going to be possible for the Tram Trust to do without any financial support, but if this is all that they're asking for at the moment, then I think it's fair enough just to support it and see if we can get it off the ground. Um, Councillor Pat. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Pat. My question is on original recommendation. Um, say, despite the all this is being provided free of cost, and they are one or two tram trust is desperate to do this project. For example, if the council says no, can I get a, a legal um, answer? What if tram trust registered it as a business in the central city and try running it free of cost? What will be? Will will be? We will be in in a position to stop them by force, or? Um, I, I just just for our answer that question, just just to clarify, as the recommendation reads at the moment, it's 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 just asking the council to support it. So that might be nothing more than an email from the chief executive or the mayor to the regional council saying we support the tram trust full stop. So. Uh, I, if the council is wanting more than that, then I think it needs to reflect on the, resol the resolution or the wording. Um, so d is it wanting, you know, advocacy? Um, uh, anyway, so th that's the first question. I, the second question, I think, would ultimately be um, probably one that's best posed to the regional council and that they're responsible for, for public transport. So um, I'm not sure of the legalities of someone being able to just set up a, um, their own public transport system and um, 
to charge a dollar or two. So, so we'd probably, as part of the, if the resolution passes and there's some support or advocacy to the regional council, then we would probably work through those issues with them as part of that. I think they would need to probably be licensed councillor, like um, Ola or um, Uber or any taxi type service, even if they weren't, because they're carrying passengers, they're carrying the public. But um, they're, they're still going to have to do that anyway. Mm. Okay, Councillor Denison. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd, um, I think the amendments are helpful because I was still at a loss for the original recommendation. It's, it's as if the council has been putting up barriers towards the trust, and, and I don't think we have. We've known about the tram trust for over 10 years, I think at a guess maybe even 15, and they've, it seems like the evidence of what, they've, what they set out to do I'm not sure exactly how far down the track they are. So maybe an invitation to them can report to one of our committees so we can actually find out who's on the trust and what have they done and what they need to, to enact their um, aspirations. So really willing to do that, but I don't see that council's been in any way a barrier for them to achieve what they've set up to do. Thank you. Councillor Beatty. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. May I seek clarification? In the submission, the trust basically wanted to donate the tram to the council and we could do what we liked with it because I asked um, Paul O'Brien the question. So does this recommendation cover that? Because there seems to be conversations around Horizons but I don't think it's the intention of the tram trust to be working with Horizons, it's to be working with the, um, our city council. So through you Mr Mayor if I can get some clarification. Oh, sorry, I'm looking back at you, <laughs> Councillor Hancock. I suppose you don't really know. Look, uh, Council, Councillor Beatty is um, correct in terms of the yeah, the tram trust is actually going to raise the raise the funds for the uh, for the trackless heritage tram. Um, they they are going to donate donate with the council, and um, after after that, I guess there there might be down the down the track. Excuse the pun. Um, some um, some costs in terms of maintenance and keeping the whole thing rolling. I guess, but and, and look, if, if I can probably say here, and thanks to some of the councillors for their questions and inputs, is that I, I recognise this as a really awkward kind of uh, uh, submission to make to the long-term plan because um, it's 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 not your it's, it's not your common garden kind of sort of um, um, submission. So. Yeah, and other councils I know in Newcastle and also Christchurch, they have trusts that run these sorts of things. Um, and th those on the trust that I know of is uh, George Zander, um, Andrew Rushworth, uh, Paul O'Brien, of course, uh, Peter Shilton. So they were the, the ones that um, I've connected with. They have been in hibernation, as Councillor Dennison said. They sort of uh, have been around for more than a decade um, and been working on different things, but this project has um, never sort of permutated to the top. Right, um, Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and just much along the lines of, of Councillor Beatty, I think we should be, as a city, welcoming this initiative and seeing what we can do to work with them. I really don't think we need to complicate it with the whole Horizon system, which is quite a complex beast as we're learning through the review. It's a great opportunity for the city if the Tram Trust is in a position um, to provide us with such um, a vehicle. Let's look to accommodate it and capitalise for the city centre. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hancock, you're in the queue. Do you need to speak again? No, just other than to say that um, I'm quite happy to accept the, uh, the, the amendment as it stands. All right. Uh, uh, do you need to speak to the amendment? I was just going to say, just as a, a right of reply, just as one comment was that um, the... The reason I'm happy to say at this point that we know our support and then le and leave it at that, I appreciate the comments from the officer, was because um, when Paul came in and made the submission, he said in terms of next steps from council, they just wanted council to confirm their support. They weren't asking for anything else at this point in time. So um, Councillor Bate is right. The, the bigger picture is to be able to donate something to the city, but that's that's years away. So in the, in the short term, they just need some sort of confirmed support, which is what's triggered Councillor Hancock to put this up. Um, and I think that that's, that's all we need to do at the moment. We don't need to overcomplicate it with anything else. We just need to note our support, have that confirmed through this chamber, whatever that means in the interim, 
we'll, we'll find out what the next steps are. All right, thank you. Um, right, we'll vote on the amendment first. Pass 16 votes for, none against, and councillors will then vote on the substantive. That's 16 votes for and none against. Thank you. Right, the next one is around uh, uh, council investigating options uh, and value proposition of providing free bus fares for priority groups, including youth, elderly and low-income persons, uh, in time to inform the new fare review process led by the regional council. Uh, that's proposed by Councillor Barrett, seconded by Councillor Johnson. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, as you're aware, in our consultation document, we asked for public feedback around the public transport um, services in the city and how we might improve those, and we got a range of feedback. Some of that feedback did include um, exploring um, free fares as a way to further activate the bus system and, and realize some of those benefits of getting people um, on buses. Um, for those of you that have followed the detail of the Q&A document, um, in our, in our um, online exchanges in the week leading up to this meeting. Um, you'll be aware that officers have come back with, with quite clear advice around it, that it's, that it's reasonably complex and they would actually need to do some investigation to actually bring us a proper answer around it, and fair enough. So this is simply a recommendation that asks for um, that investigation to happen. Um, there is a, an overall review of the bus system that Horizons Regional Council is um, commencing um, in the near future. Um, and this could dovetail quite nicely um, with that. So I think the rationale around bringing it back to this table as well is that it actually helps us think about how we're um, planning for and accommodating the transport needs in the city and what some of the options might be that we might at least want to be aware of um, while also making sure that we've got a robust input into Horizons um, review. The, uh, I suppose the approach here around identifying priority groups, I think, um, is, is probably fairly self-explanatory, but basically there are groups of people um, in the community that would disproportionately benefit from better access to transport services, and so we'd really want to um, focus the exploration um, on those groups um, before we make any um, decisions that would have any um, tangible or financial impact. So this is just an information back um, recommendation, and I'd ask that you would support it on that basis. Councillor Harper. Just the question around the cost, and I don't know if the officers have any indication or that's what you were sort of trying to tease out with the questions, whether there was any cost around, if the officers know. Oh, there'll be cost, I'm sure. Oh, <laughs> we're giving free buses. That's, that's what I want to know, so that what would the impact be on rates, what the cost would be? I think that's what the report's trying to seek, isn't it? What are the costs? So how do we make a decision when we don't know what the cost of this was. Um, uh, Councillor, I think that the, I, I, uh, I was of the same opinion, but actually what, what, um, what the mover and the seconder are seeking is that officers seek um, to investigate this process uh, and come back with a paper that says it's X, Y, Z. I think that's what we're trying to do. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Again, how do we make that decision for the rates today? Um, well, we can't. We can't. I, th I think this would then become an annual budget issue because this won't be done this side of um, certainly the financial end of the so financial year. So it would, the earliest is that this would be a annual budget issue. Year two. For next year. For year two. Okay, thank yeah, you. At the earliest. That's great. That great information. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bowen. Mr Mayor, speaking in support of this recommendation, um, the Council doesn't run the buses, Horizons does, um, but we do have influence into that process, one would hope. Um, we've seen, in the city, we've seen great success in previous years with our um, 
free bus fares for tertiary students, which, yeah, and we all know there's no such thing as free. That is an arrangement where it's free at the point of access for tertiary students, but it's the cost is covered by arrangement with the tertiary institutions themselves. And one of the things I'm interested in in this recommendation is that investigation of options and the value proposition. So, for example, if we were to look at providing free bus fares, say, for high school students, are high schools interested in partnering with us in the same way our tertiary institutions do? So there are many ways to get to this. I think it's a very worthy conversation. It generated you know, some good support through the submissions process, and I certainly don't see any difficulty with exploring further at this stage. So I'd ask you to support it. Councillor Johnson. Um, I mean, oh, just to be clear, what we're asking for at the moment is an investigation. Um, so, you know, at this stage, we don't know what the cost of providing this would be. So we're just asking for support for an investigation. I mean, I think it's well worth doing um, because at the same time that we're trying to reduce the number of cars in the CBD and we know that private transport um, is contributing about a quarter of our, you know, about 25% of our carbon emissions, anything that we can do to try and um, make use of public transport more palatable for people or accessible for groups that find it expensive at the moment, I think is worth looking into. So, um, you know, I'd urge you to support this. I think it's got ramifications uh, wider than just public transport. It also feeds into some of our other goals. Um, before I go back to you, Councillor Barrett, look, I'm, I'm OK with the investigation and, and report because I think it does inform us. Um, remember, though, councillors, we have been here before. We offered the regional council some uh, free money and it was not taken up. Um, and I'd have to say I've been somewhat... Um, Disappointed that we haven't got there with some things. Um, but it does need partners, otherwise it's just going to fall on the ratepayers again. So it does need to include our friends at Horizons. Um, uh, it does need to include perhaps NZTA or the government. It does need to include perhaps schools or other entities that can help, and, and possibly us. But um, that this report will certainly inform that. Um, our numbers are really, really bad for public transport. Uh, let's make no bones about it. And uh, it's being masked a little bit by our um, subsidisation of tertiary students. Um, so the regional council, I suppose, in some ways are on notice around that. Uh, and I'm sure uh, the government and uh, NZTA will be talking to them about that as well. This may help. Um, and uh, for all the reasons that Councillor Johnson and, and I'm sure Councillor Barrett will endorse, we do need to try and make this system better. Um, all good cities have a very good um, public transport or bus system, and this city used to lead when the city ran it. I'll leave you with that comment. Back to you, Councillor Barrett. Uh, you've summed up well, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Take over time. Okay, this vote. <laughs> That's passed 16 votes for, none against, thank you. Right, uh, the next one is very, what I call, um, mainly academic in the sense that uh, we're just seeking that we receive a footpaths and pathways program report uh, be come to us annually as part of program 1679. It used to come to us, um, and it's um, no fault, but it seemed to have just dropped off the radar. So uh, as the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor, we're just seeking that um, we just get this, because I think it's a, a good um, evidence and advice about what our footpaths are like. Um, we have lots of comments, and some of them are informed and some are not informed. At least this way we'll know where we actually sit with our, our footpaths, um, what work's been done on them, uh, what new paths have been done, and what maintenance has been done. So I seek your support on this. There's no other speakers, so we'll vote, please. It's passed 16 votes for, none against. Moving through to the last one on page two is that uh, any submissions relating to the district plan decisions be referred to staff for consideration with the review of the next district plan. Um, that has uh, been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by myself. I'll go to you, Deputy Mayor, if you need to talk to that. 
This is just a sort of catch-all recommendation. Um, there were a number of submissions that um, requested action from council that actually needs to be done through the district plan. Um, we are at the very, very early stages of um, moving into our sectional district plan review, and so um, there will be a, lo a lot of work done um, over the coming years really around this and so anything that um, has come through that actually falls within um, district plan, it, it's just a suggestion that those be referred to staff and um, they'll be considered with pol any changes. Great. Thank you. No other speakers? We'll look to vote please. It has passed 16 votes for, none against. Now we move to page three. Got a bit of pace on now. This is around goal two. Uh, and this is again a result of public consultation that the various submissions on, when it comes back, on new facilities for aquatic sports, competitive swimming, canoe polo, water polo, and indoor sports, gym sports, netball, basketball, and tennis be referred to the Regional Sports Facilities Plan in Year 1, and then that in order for uh, the decision-making framework and needs assessments to be independently uh, assessed by Sport Manor 2, and that Council provides extra provision of 50,000 to enable capacity in Year 1. Uh, Councillor Harpeter, and seconded by um, Councillor Me and Councillor Harpeter. Thank you. Um, we all sat through many... Um submissions on sporting facilities for aquatics, indoor sporting um, facilities and um, things to do with sport. And um, we just thought that we really needed to refer it to the Regional Sporting Facilities Plan in the first instance and then basically go through a decision-making framework and needs assessment and then it be independently assessed by Sport Manawatu basically to prov and have that 50k um, in there for that reason. Um, we know that through the question and answers that I asked a couple of times that um, it was put up that it could have been 50k in year two or it could have been, you know, it was also put up that there could have been 50k for aquatics and then it, there was another one that said that it could have been 50k for indoor sports. We've just had several conversations with Sport 102 that they said that they could do this within a 50k envelope. So that's why this has been put up like this. Um, we feel that this is the best way forward in talking with the Chair of Sport, um, sorry, the Chair of Sport, and going forward, this is the best way to put this up as a recommendation. I hope you'll support it. We did get a lot of a lot of submissions in terms of the sporting facilities, um, wanting to bundle it together so that they're all covered and all the needs are covered in terms of aquatics, in terms of indoor sport needs. Um, the um, CE of Sport Manawatu 2 thought this was the best way forward as well because we have had a long discussion with him over this. So we're not missing any sports out. We just thought this was the best way forward. Thank you, Councillor. Um, if I could just make comment. Look, we've agreed as a council this is how we were going to deal with these requests. Um, in the past, when we've had um, somewhat um, ad hoc requests uh, that they come through, uh, and they need to go through the Regional uh, Sports Facility Plan. Uh, that's uh, been done at an independent level uh, uh, from Sport Manor 2, and they have the expertise to handle that. That's stage one. If it then um, meets or puts put through that design making framework and the needs assessment, and the big one's the needs assessment, um, it, then, it then gets into that feasibility stage, that's stage two. Even then, it still needs to go through the rigour of uh, uh, meeting that test, and then, then you get into putting money into possible um, plans and programmes. Sport Manor 2, we're going to do this uh, review of this whole um, uh, regional sports facility plan in year two, uh, that was planned then, uh, with, the, with this um, avalanche of um, um, requests and submissions, uh, it was the, it was the uh, thoughts that we bring uh, this forward into year one. It enables them to do some 
catch all and, and uh, connect all the indoor sports and the aquatic sports and put them through this uh, rig more rigorous test rather than doing individual feasibility plans here and there. Um, we'll speak to bowls perhaps a little bit differently later because they've already been through uh, one stage of this already. So um, I'm very happy to support the councillor's uh, recommendation. I think it's, uh, it's a good way of dealing with this um, in a timely manner but also in an appropriate manner um, rather than uh, having various groups um, lobbying um, and coming through front doors, back doors, side doors uh, and uh, attempting to get their facilities, which are all fantastic, don't get me wrong, but there does need to be some sort of order in all of this. Right, um, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm happy to support the uh, recommendation. It seems a, a tidy way forward in terms of uh, addressing or approaching the number of submissions we got from various sporting codes that all equally wanted a feasibility study or equally wanted investment in um, particular facilities. I think, as the Mayor's put it, um, it sort of sidesteps some of the lobbying as well and depoliticises some of those um, decisions. It seems like a fair process to be able to um, to engage with the um, with Sportman or two uh, to do this piece of work, um, considering their position and um, the work that they've already undertaken, um, putting a regional lens over it. Um, and, and the reality is, is that we can't do everything. There is going to be need to be an element of prioritising. Um, so I think that having that independent um, assessment is going to be useful for us in setting our budgets of, of what we are going to be investing in. Um, so I'm happy to support this, and um, I think it also provides a, um, a clear response to those organisations who have asked for investment in, in particular facilities to know that um, it's going to be rigorously assessed in, in actually looking at what the needs are in the region um, and making decisions on where the investment should go. Um, you want to speak, David? Uh, yeah, just um, a little bit of advice um, to assist with your decision making um, on, on this matter. So I think there may have been a little bit of confusion potentially, but um, the Regional Sports Facilities Plan sets out the process um, and the first stage of that is a feasibility study, which is typically being delivered by the council. Um, and that is done independently, so typically a contractor is brought in uh, to do that piece of work. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what additional value um, Sport Manawa 2 are going to add over and above what the core function of council is in, in this role in terms of providing that advice through to council on the feasibility studies for facilities it's looking to invest in. Um. Um, could I just ask why we've got a regional sports facility plan then? So... Uh, I, it appears through the submissions and the conversation there's been an assumption that the feasibility study doesn't include a needs assessment. Um, it does, that's part of, uh, so, so the feasibility study isn't where are we going to build this and how much will it will cost. The first stage of that is do we need it? Um, and that's a function that's been undertaken by the council um, to inform council decision making. Sorry, that didn't answer my question. So why do we need a regional sports facilities plan? To set the framework for decision Thank making. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Naylor. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I actually have um, uh, some more questions, really. I think we need to tease this out a little bit more and get a bit better understanding. Um, through the question and answer process, I put in a question about um, Program 1913, which is 21,000 in year, in year two, um, to carry out a review of the um, regional sports facility um, plan. And um, the, the answer to that question, I said, is that adequate to carry out this review? And the, question, the answer was that it's, an, it's antip anticipated that other pro rata contributions will come from other councils in the region and from Sport New Zealand. Um, so I guess, and looking at page 115 in our support supporting material, there's multiple um, programs that ha we have got funding for feasibility studies, for um, needs assessments, and 
for maintaining um, investment into the regional sports facilities plan and, and, on, and including that programme, which is an ongoing review of the regional sports facility plan. I'm not sure that we actually need an additional budget. I do think we need a good framework for informing the decisions that we need to make, but I think, and perhaps some more officer comment might be useful, but it, look, it appears to me that we're quite well, um, well equipped in terms of the budgets that are already included in our plan to, um, to, to fund a lot of that work. Is, is there any my, way that my, we my understanding in talking to Sportman or two is we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sports that are after new facilities. Yeah. Um, when they were refreshing the plan in year two, uh, they thought they were reviewing the existing plan and possibly looking at a couple. Hence, we're now loading them with uh, quite a lot um, and uh, they, this is to give them some capacity to make some, some high-level judgments around that. So the, I guess what, just to make a comment, mm. um, the capacity that I see that is included already in our plan includes Program 1422, which is Regional Sports Facility Plan Investment Process Management, includes um, one... Um, 1899 Aquatic Facilities and Water Recreation Preliminary Feasibility Study includes 1906 Sports Field Artificial Turf Detailed Feasibility Assessment, 1912 Indoor Courts Preliminary Feasibility Study and Needs Assessment, 1913 Review of the Manawatu Wanganui Regional Sports Facility Plan and ongoing. So I guess what I'm saying is surely we can do that within these programs that already exist. I mean, maybe they do need to be realigned to um, address the multiple demands on sports facilities. I would agree with that. But I guess what I'm suggesting is that we give direction to a process to utilise the funds that are already in our plan to um, progress that work appropriately. Um, I don't believe we need an additional 50,000 in okay. order to do that. It's up to them. And so I'd, I guess I'd, in saying that, I would be happy, uh, I won't support this, but if this fails, I would be, or oh, perhaps, um, I would support this work being done within the existing capacity, I guess is probably the most straightforward way of doing it. The other one that I can't see included there is the bowls. The, There's another motion oh, around see. bowls. Mm. Okay. So perhaps could I, if there was uh, someone that would be willing to... Um, support an amendment that um, that I would to take that council provides extra provision of 50k be deleted um, and I would support the work being done within existing resources given how much is already in our budget. Yep, got a seconder with Councillor Bowen. We'll just get that up on screen for you. So is there anything else you wanted to ask the councillor? Um, I'll leave it at that. OK. Um, I'll go to you, Councillor Bowen. You're next. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I did have some questions, um, uh, which probably reflect some of the same concerns Councillor Nail has brought forward, that came out of the responses to um, the questions from Councillor Harper that are in the document. Because um, the Councillor Harper rightly asked for the, the cost for needs assessment for all of those things. And the officer response was, all of this work is covered by proposed programmes. These budgets allow for external consultant engagement. Um, so I suppose my question to officers is, is, is all of that work covered? Do, you, do we need to give Sport Manor two fifty thousand dollars to do this? Or is this work already being covered by external consultants? Because that's what it says. Well, we have budgets to do the feasibility studies for all of those work. Uh, all of those pieces of work. What I would say, um, in addition to the comments I said earlier, uh, one of the things we could do, um, while well, Sport Manor 2 would be a key stakeholder in all of those feasibility studies, and there's no reason why we can't ask them to uh, review the work that's done by 
independent consultants, so that you have independent consultants, sport review as a uh, sport manual two as a um, as a stakeholder and reviewer, and then officers uh, bringing that advice back on the individual feasibility studies. And would we expect to pay sport manual two extra for that work, or is that within the terms of their contract? Uh, kia ora, apologies. We're struggling a little bit to understand the intention of the um, proposal here. So it is correct to say that those various facilities um, assessments are proposed in budgets. Um, we were expecting, I suppose, as a result of submissions that councillors may wish to be talking about the timing of those mm. different projects. Um, there are a couple of different things. One is that Sport Manawa 2 do have funding to um, work with various codes in terms of looking at the um, facilities needs assessments. Separately, there is a review of the of the plan, and that's what's um, currently. It's year two, though, year Julie. Two. That's yeah. right. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure Sport Manawa Two would benefit from. Well, they were here earlier, but I think they, um, yeah, they they could see this was going to be a long day. Yes, they were. Um, we went party to those conversations with Sport Manawa Two about that management of the contract, which is managed by staff. So. Um, it's a little bit difficult to provide advice on the fly about what that contract might involve in terms of the responsibilities of Sport Manawa 2. Mm. Okay. Mr Mayor, um, if I may, could we perhaps, since it looks like we're going to go on to Friday, could we perhaps this. pause this and reconsider it on Friday when we've got more advice? Um, yeah, I suppose we could. I just, and I just thought we might get to a better... A we're just right in the middle of it. I'd prefer to... We've, right. got, okay. we've got amendments in that there. If we'd just started it, yes. But we're right in the middle of it. I'd like to put it to bed in terms of we're either going to do this or we're not going to do it. Um, so, um, have, you, have you finished there, Julie? Um, one second. Yeah. Mr Mayor, I know I've seconded this um, amendment, but with the difficulty in answering the questions because of the relationship with Sport Manua 2, I would feel much more comfortable if we could come back to this on Friday. Okay. Can I just make a comment first? Um, I, I just wonder if we've got the cart before the horse. Possibly. We're jumping to feasibility studies. Um, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sorry because officers are puffing and puffing and everything else. But I'm sorry, but we do have a process here. It's, sorry? Sorry, did you want to say something? We do have a process of, this is around, um, this is what the Regional Sports Facility Plan is about. It, it's, it's the is, the, is there a 50 metre pole here? Then I understand we go to the facility, uh, we go to a feasibility study. Otherwise, we're setting expectations that we're going to do something, and we're spending a hundred thousand plus on every one of these. Now we've got competitive swimming, canoe polo, water polo, gym sports, netball, basketball, tennis. Football. It's quite a sizable bit. To, we shouldn't. I mean, have we have we changed the plan? I don't know. There just seems to be some differences of opinion. If I, if I could add, um, I think you will see from the proposed budgets that there is a water sports um, assessment process. There's not an individual one for canoe polo for um, all the other various water sports. It is an entire water sports project that's planned. Um, the little chat we were having before, Emery is just pointing out to me that gym sports and some of those other codes that have been making deputations to the council are already in training, working with Sport Manawa 2 and staff in terms of working through the process. So. Um, I mean, we're happy to have conversations with Sport Manawa too about their level of, you know, resource that might be required to work through with codes because obviously there are other things emerging all the time. As you say, that's that's why the plan will be reviewed. Um, but those things are already already happening. All right, thanks, Julie. That's helpful. Look, I think what we'll do because there is differences of opinion here. Um, we get the, the main party isn't here that should be commenting on this, which is Sport Manawa too. We'll get them back tomorrow, um, Friday morning. Um, in the meantime, perhaps somebody at a, at a high level, David or Julie, can speak with Sport Manawa too, um, get an understanding of what they can do or can't do, and if things have changed, um, then perhaps as elected members we need to know. Right, we'll move through to the 
next one, and maybe we do push that to the side as well, because it's round the covered bowling green. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna bring it up. All right. Okay, this is again another one around sports. Um, that the council confirms support for the current feasibility study undertaken by Sport Manawatu for a covered bowling green, noting that this will determine the best options for the location of the covered bowling green. Uh, back to you, Councillor Harpeter. Um, the reason why we want to just continue with this is that Sport Manawatu have already undertaken the feasibility and are part way through it already. Um, we already want to say that um, Palmerston North, uh, North Bowls and Takaro Bowls are wanting to put um, a covered green in both of their facilities. So that's why it's really important that the independence of Swart Mana 2 carry on with this feasibility and look at the location of where this should be for the city rather than us putting our oar in. And we just continue with Sport Mana or two doing this feasibility. And I don't think we should rock the boat on this one at all. We should just let them carry on going with it and let it carry on going and not upset the whole apple cart. They're not asking for any funding. They have already just want to carry on going and carry on with that feasibility. OK, thank you. Um, before, I go, uh, before we go to the, um, some questions or comments, um, Julie. I might just to clarify that... Um, that's not actually correct. Sport Manawatu haven't carried out a feasibility study. There was a programme proposed into the 10-year plan process that wasn't carried forward by councillors. There's certainly been a lot of work going on. There's a difference between the merger of the clubs and all the work that's gone on there and this new proposal for a covered venue. They're two different things. Yeah, we understand that. <laughs> Okay, we'll tease it out with questions and comments. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. It was just a question, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure who my question is for. Um, so we've, we had confirmation from Sport Manawatu staff that they were undertaking a feasibility study on the covered bowling green. And then, I guess, taking on board the comments from the officer just now, I'm, I'm wondering if our um, definition of a feasibility study aligns with their definition of a feasibility study um, and whether the work that they're undertaking, that Sport or two is currently undertaking, what, whatever format that may be, is there an intention that they would report that back to or, or present their findings through to the council or is that something that we would have to request um, because it sounds like it might be possibly more of an informal arrangement rather than th mm. through the council? But how, how would we capture the work that they are doing? Because they are obviously doing something. It's a little bit difficult to answer that question. Um, Sport number two obviously are working with bowls and have been for a very long time. Um, the, the proposal that came in that was not included in the 10-year plan was as a result of the discussions with Sport Manawatu 2 and the work they've been doing with bowls. So um, our understanding is that there isn't a formal feasibility study, a detailed feasibility study, um, looking at the options for delivery of that project. I can't answer your question beyond that. Okay. Um, Councillor Dennison. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. There's been reference made that Takaro Bowling Club wants to have their own when there's been centred around a partnership under the Bowl Steering Group. Referencing back to the submission from the Bowl Steering Group, I just want to clarify the confusion. I don't think Takaro Bowling Club are wanting one at Takaro. They're submitting. They want the 50000 for a feasibility study as under the Bowl Steering Group under submission 664. Can I understand where the idea of one at Takaro comes in with one at Northern and then one at Palmerston North? It's confusing and I don't believe it aligns with what's happening. Um, I can't answer that, sorry. Um, I don't know if any officer can either. Um. Um, I'll speak then. Uh, one of the things is I think we should be going with the bowl steering group submission. And where I think the confusion is, it was done and represented by Phil Meads, who is part of the Takaro Sports Club, uh, bowling club. 
they are clearly outlining that they've spent 12000 already on a pre-feasibility study and they have been engaged with both Terrace End, Takaro and Northern, the three, three bowling clubs that fell out of the five initial, um, have been working forward since December 2018, is in reference here, and have actually been advocating for a 50,000 feasibility study for a number of years. It was in our pre-draft debates, uh, workshops, which got withdrawn, to their surprise. They're asking for that to be funded 50,000. The other request is 650, which is 300 for an artificial turf and up to one third of the cost of the cover, which is up to a maximum of 350. So that's where the 650 comes from, just for clarity. My feeling is that we should put, and this is where, which comes first, this recommendation believing Sport 102 have it in hand, or the one that's following that actually allocates quite clearly 50,000. Uh, for it to be completed in year one, a feasibility study. And so, therefore, I just want to differentiate the two recommendations. I'm quite clear on the way forward and um, promote uh, the following recommendation as something that would achieve what was first desired by the bowling steering group. Thank you. Good points. I'm sure it adds to the confusion a little bit, to be honest. <laughs> Um, look, could I, could I suggest that these three, and yours coming up, Councillor Denison, which is very valid and may actually end up where we go to, could, could we wait till Friday, get Sport Manawatu two here, understand what's happening, have a clear understanding as elected members what's going on um, and what we're committing ourselves to and what we're not, and I think that would be a better way forward. Okay? Yeah. Right, we're doing that. All right, um, moving on. Um, the next one is uh, that Council establish an Esplanade uh, Master Plan Project Steering Group. The terms are referenced to include uh, Bonsai House, Shade House, Avery's, and possible Chinese Garden, and to be approved by Council. And that was subject to the standing order, um, of which needed six. Uh, signatures to um, get this discussed again. Um, now, I've, I've moved this and it's been seconded by the Deputy Mayor and I think my, my, my motives haven't changed from what I tried to do uh, some weeks ago. This is around trying to get um, some sort of discipline around what we're doing um, and enacting and, and the master plan. Uh, it's a process that has worked extremely well with the arena with multiple programs. Uh, it's around keeping controls over um, uh, the projects themselves, which, um, as we've just seen, um, can, can have a scope creep. So uh, I believe this is something that can be, it, it can be established later in the year. It doesn't need to be established tomorrow. Um, and just seeking your support on that. It doesn't tie us into anything. It just means that there... I know there's a user group. Uh, this is different to the user group, which has a approximately 18 different um, organisations on it. This is around, and they would be represented on it, by the way, but this is around having a clear terms of reference, um, what the projects are, uh, budgets, etc. Mr Mayor, can I just, sorry, just seek some clarification. This includes reference to the Chinese Garden, which is the subject of the next recommendation, so currently it doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, so we might need to do the Chinese good, Garden one first. Good, good point. We can swap them around. Thank you. Um, excuse me, Mr Mayor. Um, it's, you've mentioned that this is subject to Standing Order 2.25.1 and required six signatures. Um, have you got six, six sig signatures? Okay. So... Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Bowen. Um, Right, we'd better move to the next one because if this doesn't work, then the other one doesn't work. All right, so as a result of public consultation, that council explores the feasibility of siting a Chinese garden uh, within the Victoria Esplanade in year four, noting that this does not commit council to the establishment or the location of a garden. Um, so councillors, I've moved this, it's been seconded by Councillor Harpeter. Um, this came through a submission from the... Um, Manawatu um, Chinese community, 
Uh, they are our region's largest community, um, ethnic community of nearly 10,000. Um, they have built um, the uh, Chinese gazebo at um, the cemetery, uh, and uh, they v very rarely, if anything, seek funds from our council. Uh, they're a strong organisation. Uh, I've been to a couple of very, very preliminary um, open meetings around the possible establishment of a Chinese garden, which the community want to drive and run. Um, now, we either um, kick it to touch or we look at where it possibly could go. Um, officers have been um, over this. Um, but we just need to understand whether this could be explored or we don't do it. So this is really just um, responding to the submission at hand. Councillor Nola. Okay. Uh, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I just wanted to clarify, is the exploring the feasibility happening in year four or is the... Is it looking to be established for for year four? No, um, it's it's putting it into year four. Putting the feasibility into year four. Mm. Thank you. Um, Councillor Beatty. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. This was around the same question. If you're wanting a feasibility, um, you'll need a budget for that. And I'm just wondering... If you're going to put a feasibility into year four, wouldn't you want to bring that? Or are you just trying to decide on a site whether it's feasible to have it on the Esplanade or not? It, it's around, uh, they have seeked a location um, and they, like, they would like it to go to the Esplanade and, um, and, and uh, it's really, can it be established there or can it not be established there? So I'm happy to support it, but I think year four, I think it needs to, if it's just a case of whether they can have it or not, I think you should bring that up to year one so that if it gets kicked to touch, they can look somewhere else. And if we do decide to have it, then we can look at it and, and you're looking year four, then we can look at to year, into the next long-term plan and put money for it in there. Or if you have it, if your steering group gets passed, you can start doing some planning with them there. Um, look, I'm, I'm OK with that. I don't know if the officers wants to... Um, Cathy wants to comment. I'm not sure whether the group's quite ready at year one, but... Well, year two, mm. yeah. Mm. Uh, that would be my comment. Year one would be too early. What we're really looking at here, councillors, is if... if um, the um, other recommendation goes ahead and you're establishing a steering group, then we really need that steering group to have the ability to look at everything in the master plan, how it might be cited funding. Um, and that includes physical as well as um, financial, so we really need some time to do that. Well, may I suggest you take year four out and just don't have a year in there? Uh, is, is the seconder OK with that? So that's you, Leone. Thank you. <laughs> It's been a long day, I can appreciate that. All right, we'll take you out within the uh, Victoria Spinard. Okay, Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, I just want to speak in favour of this as something that we do action, um, because as we found out when we did the multicultural passport to play, for a multicultural city, we actually don't have very many uh, representations of other cultures throughout the city. Um, it's an area that we're somewhat lacking in. And um, if I remember rightly, the idea of the Chinese garden was also brought to us during the last long-term plan as well. Um, so, you know, I'm very supportive of the idea of us having more multicultural, um, uh, you know, natural and built uh, things within the city. And in particular, the, the Chinese garden idea, um, you know, I don't know if any of you have seen Chinese gardens in other cities, but, for example, Dunedin, which I visited six months or so ago, is absolutely beautiful, and it's a huge tourist attraction in Dunedin. So um, I'm strongly supportive. I don't feel uh, that I particularly want to leave it to year four. Um, and I would just ask, if we, if we pass this through, do we not need to put a budget in for a feasibility? Because otherwise, it's just an intention without any money behind it. We might not get anywhere. I'll, I'll go to the officer on that. I'll get myself into trouble with feasibilities. 
Um, in this particular case, um, because we've got quite a lot of knowledge and expertise within the organisation to be able to tell you what the um, not only the, the um, physical location would be, but what it involves and also the ongoing operational impacts. Um, a Chinese garden, we've already done a bit of work on this, involves a lot of ongoing staff management. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So is that, we don't need to put a budget in then, Cathy? Yeah, okay. Well then, very supportive. And I, I would urge you all to support it in a wider sense of it, of us really wanting to make some more permanent commitment to our multicultural communities across the city. And this is just one of a number of things that I'd quite like to see us do. Councillor Barron. Yes, echoing Councillor Johnson's comments there. And uh, Mr May, you mentioned the Chinese um, gazebo at the cemetery. And I know that's been deeply significant for our Chinese community. Many of them have sought me out particularly to mention that. Um, Chinese gardens have a particular significance culturally for um, those communities living away from their homeland. And I know this will be deeply significant for them if we can um, find a way to go ahead in a suitable location, which might or might not be the Victoria Esplanade. So yeah, absolutely support us exploring this at this stage. Uh, Councillor Bud. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I am, I mean, basically in support of this, but I'm confused in the last sentence that um, this doesn't commit council to the establishment or location of a garden. Does that mean that they can establish this garden anywhere in the Esplanade without consulting the council? No, no. What it means is um, if, for instance, in all honesty, the Esplanade's quite full, mm -hmm. even though it's 18 hectares, it actually is quite full. So to create a space for the Chinese garden has to be treated very sensitively where it could go. What this um, uh, recommendation means that um, the location may need to be somewhere else within the city. Okay. Okay, so it's not committing us to the Victoria Esplanade, which is um, where they would like to go and, and possibly the ideal place. But um, as the officers know and I know, that um, beautiful space is very full now. Thank you. Would possibly mean something else going, and I'm just not sure whether we can do that, but anyway. All right, um, look, write a reply. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your advice around taking years out. Um, and look, I hope you can support it. Thank you. We'll vote. It's passed 16 votes for and none against, thank you. We'll jump back to the first one again. Um, now, I've already spoken to this, so I'll open it up for any, any um, other comments. Councillor Manola. Thank you, I won't be supporting this. My um, recollection then when it was discussed at a committee recently um, that it wasn't supported and my reasons for voting against it then um, remain. I think we have an Esplanade master, ma you know, a steer uh, an Esplanade um, group already. I don't think we need another one and I do think that it's preferable when there are decisions to be made about um, the Esplanade or any changes, that, they, that those decisions should be made here in the chamber or be confirmed here um, rather than delegating that responsibility to a, um, yet another steering group. Uh, Councillor Denison. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Similar to uh, when it was last raised at committee, I'm not going to oppose it, and particularly again, even more so today, with those budgets extended into year four, majority of those, um, that the urgency to create something is... I don't see, and even the benefit of having one, I am still think is questionable. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harpeter. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Um, the user group is a group of 30 people, um, and they are just there to, um, there for their camellias, and they're there for the railways, and they're there just as a group of common people that have an interest in the Esplanade. They're not there to talk about matters of a steering group, of a budget, of a group that really need to make decisions on the Esplanade. So the user group is not the kind of group that you want to make decisions of a budgetary nature. So that is not the right group that you want to make the decisions for the Esplanade. 
which is where Councillor Naylor was coming from. A, 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 steering, a steering group is a group that, that helps make decisions that, that when you look at what they did with the arena, it actually really pulled the whole plan together as a master plan. So I think we've got the wrong view of what a master plan steering group is all about, and that's what works so well for the arena. So I think the user group is a user group, and it can feed in and get advice on certain aspects, but it's not a decision-making group, and we should really distinguish between the two groups. So don't think we should push them together and mash them together and make them one. But I definitely think the steering group is really valid and we should have it. Thank you. Councillor Bowen. Thank you. I, I'm definitely talking about a steering group and not a user group. Um, I, I've not been part of the Arena Master Plan Project Steering Group, so probably my question comes out of wanting to understand um, the success of that project and what you as the mover and maybe officers feel it would add here, because my understanding of the success of the Arena Master Plan Project Steering Group was largely that we had a very good project manager. So is the intention that this Master Plan Project Steering Group would also include an external project manager, and would we need to bud allocate a budget towards that? Is, is that what we mean by a so, Master Plan so, Project so Steering Group? So could I start with answering that, as I was the chair of, of, of that very successful proven model? Um, at ARENA, it, it, it sets discipline. Exactly what is lacking in some of the, some of the projects. It sets discipline around um, terms of reference, around scope. Um, it's the how to get things done. And, and look, the, the, I've seen, heard some comments that the decisions will be made outside this chamber. The, the word approved by council is in black and white there. This is just rolling things up together. Um, does it need a separate project manager? That's to be determined around the terms of reference and everything. I don't think we make that decision here and now. It possibly might, I don't know. But there's going to be um, one, two, three, four, and other smaller projects um, that will be done over the next five to six, possibly seven years at the Esplanade. We've got a master plan, it's how to engage that with some discipline. So, yeah, that's all I can answer, and perhaps the officers can that have some, yeah, have some experience in it. Uh, any uh, decision regarding um, a project manager that was employed by the council would be, a would be an operational decision, and we would have to review that once we understood what the terms of reference entailed. Thank you, Asper. Just to follow up, because the arena is our benchmark on this, that was obviously a huge programme. Is this programme of a sufficient scale to warrant needing a steering group? Obviously, you've, you've put it up, so you think so. Oh, could I seek an officer comment on mm. that? Is this a scale where a steering group is a proportionate response? Thank Sorry, you. hot potato. <laughs> um, in terms of the uh, things like discipline and stuff like that, I think that really relates to the project manager. Uh, my understanding is that, that this steering group is intended to do things like um, seek funding and stuff like that. Um, so I'm not sure, until we really understand what the scope is, I'm not sure that I can answer that question. Communication, if I could just answer as well. Um, officer units internally. Um, unfortunately, there's no officer here that's actually... Oh, no, Bryce has been in it. Yeah. There's <laughs> one officer that's been involved in it. Anyway, you're either going to vote for it or you're not. But um, anyway, if we move on, um, is that all, Council Bar? Uh, thank you for, for, for the questions. I do appreciate that. Um, I suppose my hesitation here, which obviously you're picking up, is we seem a little bit cart before the horse. I think in order to know whether we want to establish a steering group, I, I feel like I would want to know what the terms of reference for that steering group would be. Um, and it seems to me that that would... And maybe we can't do that without deciding we're going to do it first. Yeah, so. you've, you have to do... If you don't want to do this, then it's pointless putting up a terms of reference. Um, terms of reference, you come in and you say you agree with them or you want them changed. 
You're the decision makers. Mm. Thank you. Councillor Beatty. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I am in, am in support of this, and I came to the arena steering group a bit later than most. Um, and the one thing that that I found was useful for it was, was the discipline, but it's also the expertise. And people know that during different stages of that plan, there was issues around budgets and there was over, you know, there was possible overruns. And because we had the expertise of all different staff members, plus the mayor and other <coughs> stakeholders that were around there, we were able to deliver within those budgets and also to be able to um, deliver better. And when I look at the, the master plan for the Esplanade, it's millions of dollars. And it's also such a heritage site for people like me that are born here. So I see that there's so, and, and there's so many different budgets and so many um, things that we want in the Esplanade that we might not be able to afford. I see that the steering group and its expertise can look at the whole plan and perhaps bring some of those ideas. Um, I mean, we just discussed the Chinese garden there's expertise within around people that I know that have got good relationships with the Chinese community and we've already known that those particular people may have um, uh, some money and stuff that they might be prepared to look at and we might, instead of just having a Chinese garden, be able to incorporate that with, say, the Shade House or the Bonsai. I'm just using that as an example. We might not even have a Chinese garden in there, but I think the steering group gives the flex flexibility, the expertise, but also to, to deliver the plan and to deliver it on time, if not faster, and, and perhaps be able to um, get money where just passing it across to a staff, to staff to manage as per normal, um, might not be able to give us those delivery times, but we use the expertise of the staff plus other stakeholders. Uh, Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and certainly I have sympathy for what you're desiring here in terms of getting good outcomes for one of the most precious um, open spaces in the city. Um, but I am struggling with the, with the master plan steering group um, type approaches, and I just wanted to explain myself a little bit on that in that I've um, been on some steering groups and not on some other steering groups. And the steering groups that I've been on, in a way, I'm a bit frustrated by those at times um, because it feels like the steering group is sort of distance opens up between the group and the council. And likewise, the groups that I haven't been on, I've also felt that bit of frustration because it feels like the steering group's just off steering and I'm sitting here wondering where they're steering. Um, and so to me, I guess I, where this settles is, is that probably in some cases steering groups are, are necessary, but I don't see that in this case, and if the, the point is around um, rigor and accountability, I think that um, you know, we can provide that at this table effectively, um, and, and uh, my preference um, is that we um, do that um, as, as council rather than um, butting off a um, steering group um, in this manner. So uh, yeah, well support in terms of ensuring that we do get um, rigorous um, and uh, guidance around the master planning and quality delivery in that space, but not convinced of the steering group model to get us there. Uh, Councillor Hancock. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Look, um, just, just a couple of very brief comments. Um, the value of a steering group, I see it as um, just basically having a strategic oversight um, of um, this park, you know, and it's, it's, it's our premier, one of our, well, certainly our premier park within Palmerston North, which is going to be going through a development phase and there are going to be competing needs and wants from various groups there. So, um, and, and I don't see scale as an issue. I think that um, in terms of the steering group, they can scale up, scale down according to the need at the time. So um, I'm actually going to support this because uh, strategic oversight of that particular park, I think is needed. Thank you. All right, that's exhausted the comments. Just in the right of reply, look, councillors, I urge you to um, to, to back this. Um, this will help us. Um, 
there's uh, you, you are in control in terms of the money, the but the, this group gives some discipline to ensuring that everybody is communicating with each other. We often think that is happening, but it isn't. And uh, Arena was in a classic example of if we hadn't all been talking to each other, we would have been back here asking for more money, absolutely, and uh, we would have got a, a lesser outcome too. So that's all about project management as well as the group being set up. Um, I can't really understand the resistance because you are in control. You're just putting you're putting some people that um, uh, that, that can um, crack the whip on the discipline. So um, please support it. Um, it is a it is a it is a really really um, profile uh, master plan for us with our premier park. Actually, one of New Zealand's rare uh, you know there's not many five star parks in New Zealand, and the Esplanade is right up there. And uh, look, let's, who knows, we could emulate in a small way what Hamilton Gardens has done. But um, I ask you to support it, thank you. And that has failed with seven votes, four and eight against. All right. Thank you, councillors. I think we will, we will um, stop for the day um, and we will reconvene. We need to um, extend the meeting. Please. Okay. Where's that? Okay, put it back up. Okay, we need to, the committee resolves to extend the meeting to 5 p.m. the 11th, thank goodness that, that doesn't happen, um, on the 11th of June 2021, understanding order 2.1.7. Um, I'll look to move that, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, if you could vote please. Thank you. Passed 15 votes for, none against. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your efforts today, and we will see you Friday.